I'd like to call the hearing to order this morning, and uh, today we're going to be looking at the fiscal year 2015 uh, budget for the United States Department of Energy. <clears throat> and of course, we're delighted that Secretary Moniz uh, is with us this morning. I know he's been very busy on the Hill and the Senate side as well, and we really look forward to his testimony today and to the opportunity to ask questions uh, regarding uh, uh, next year's Department of Energy's budget request. This time I'd like to recognize myself for five minutes for an op opening statement. <clears throat> DOE, of course, is tasked with developing and implementing a coordinated national energy policy, one that should further and all of the above energy strategy. It should also be fostering private sector competition and innovation of advanced energy technologies. A national energy policy should also continue to support job creation and our manufacturing renaissance by providing regulatory certainty rather than overreaching regulations so that we can maintain access to affordable, abundant, and reliable energy supplies. I noticed that the DOE FY 2015 budget requests $9.8 billion for DOE science and energy programs that DOE states will play a key role in achieving the President's Climate Action Plan. In other words, over a third of the entire $28 billion budget is being allocated to the President's climate agenda. This budget affirms that DOE is putting the President's climate change agenda ahead of the interest of a balanced national energy policy. Now, we can debate that, but it's quite clear that the President's climate change agenda is right at the top of the mission of the DOE at this time. This mission is further evidenced by the fact that DOE's budget once again overwhelmingly favors the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, which houses all of the President's favorite green energy programs, and in fact, the $2.3 billion request there is more than the combined budget request for the offices of electricity, fossil energy, nuclear energy, and ARPA-E. In my humble opinion, we have seen the Obama administration waste, waste too much money on green energy projects that have failed. Many have gone into bankruptcy at the expense to the taxpayer. Another issue that is of, of concern to me and many others is the proposed in the proposed budget is the substantially reduced funding for the Mixed Oxide Fuel Fabrication Facility, MOX, currently under construction at Savannah River site in South Carolina. In the case of the MOX plant, DOE has decided to abandon construction of the facility being built to eliminate <coughs> 34 tons of surplus weapons plutonium, a project that was initiated in the Clinton administration. At this point, $4 billion has already been spent, and the facility is 60 percent complete. Uh, yet the Department has decided to shut down construction, and it appears without any record of decision or any proposed alternative or any analysis of the ramifications. Now, maybe they're there, but maybe we just haven't seen them yet. Congress appropriated funds for the construction, uh, but it is my understanding that DOE does intend to use those funds instead to shut down the project, resulting in 1,800 people at risk of being laid off at their job. And it is disturbing because of what had happened at Yucca Mountain. The money that was spent at Yucca Mountain, that was stopped. The lawsuits that were filed as a result of that and the liability of the federal government under those lawsuits, uh, people who are concerned about our debt are genuinely concerned about wasting that amount uh, of, of money. I want to thank Secretary Moniz uh, for appearing with us today on this budget. And as I said in the beginning, uh, he's been a real uh, uh, energetic Secretary of Energy. He's willing to engage on these issues at any point, and it's good to have uh, open discussion with him, and I want to commend him uh, for that. We look forward to hearing his testimony and asking him questions about the budget. 
And at this time, uh, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for his uh, five-minute opening statement. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you, Secretary Moniz, for being here today to discuss DOE's FY15 budget. Secretary Moniz, I would like to commend you for establishing the Minorities and in Energy Initiative at DOE. Following discussions where I expressed my strong and overriding desire to increase minority participation and involvement within all sectors of the in energy industry. While I believe that this is a first a good first step. I have some serious concerns regarding the amount of resources the agency is actually investing in this uh, initiative as evidenced by your own budget proposal. Mr. Secretary, to me, DOE's budget is a moral do statement of principles and a covenant with the American people. Mr. Secretary, when I ask, uh, speak to my constituents about this new initiative, invariably one of the first questions that they want to know is, how committed is DOE to this program? And how much of the department's vast resources is the agency willing to invest to ensure that this initiative achieves uh, overwhelming success? Mr. Secretary, I'm sure that you understand that in minority communities around the country, there's always uh, skepticism when new programs or new policies are announced supposing to help increase opportunity, but the resources to help make them successful are not included. So when members who represent these communities, such as myself and many, many others, see a lack of investment in programs designed to assist minorities, it is our duty to hold the administration and the agencies responsible in order to rectify the situation. Frankly, Mr. Secretary, I'm not impressed with the investment in the Minority in, uh, Energy Initiative as it currently stands. And I don't want to work with you to make sure that we're not shortchanging these communities who are looking for honest opportunities to improve their livelihood, as so many others have already been afforded. And Mr. Secretary, we know that these opportunities are out there. In fact, we have come a long way since I first, inquired, first started inquiring into the levels of participation of minorities in all different sectors of the energy industry. And now we have the administration, the industry, schools, universities, and all, they're all talking about the concept of increasing the number of minorities in energy. As you know, I have a bill that will provide a pathway to energy jobs by reaching out to minority communities and informing them of both the opportunities available within the energy sector, as well as the skills, training, and certifications needed to take advantage of these opportunities. My office is actively reaching out to members on both sides of the aisle who understand the need for better preparing all Americans for energy jobs of the present and of the future. And I will continue to work with any and all stakeholders who are of the same mind. It's my hope, Mr. Chairman, that we can hold a hearing on this very important topic of minority participation in the energy sector in order to make up for the shortfall of workers who will be retiring and exiting the workforce, leaving behind a shortage of talented and skilled workers in their wake. The fact of the matter is that increasing the number of skilled and trained workers will, in fact, be a win for the industry, a win for the minority communities, and a win for the entire American economy as a whole. So I look forward to working with you, Mr. Secretary, as well as the members on both sides of the aisle to make this a real commitment on the part of the administration and the Congress. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back at this time, recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, Mr. Secretary, welcome back to the committee. Uh, I, for one, do appreciate your thoughtful insight and friendship. And when I look at DOE's current 
energy policies as well as its budget for fiscal year 2015. I must confess that I see an agency that is still struggling a bit to keep up with the changing energy landscape. The old assumptions of energy scarcity are somewhat pervasive and it is time for DOE to adapt. It does appear that uh, DOE's ultra cautious approach to approving LNG exports, you'd expect us to say this today, to non-free trade agreement countries does not reflect our newfound age of energy abundance. Projections from the EIA as well as DOE's own analysis confirm that we have more than enough natural gas to meet domestic needs affordably while supporting export markets, and this surplus situation is likely to last for many decades. The ramifications of DOE's policy on exports can be measured not only in the thousands of unrealized jobs that could be constructing LNG export facilities and producing the extra natural gas for export, but also in the billions in revenues that could be flowing into the country and boosting the overall economy. Geopolitical opportunities are also at risk. The mere signal that the U.S. is serious about entering export markets would have an immediate effect on our allies in Eastern Europe who are currently dependent on, that, on Russia for natural gas. In fact, reports earlier this week show that Russia upped the bill by as much as 45 to 50 percent on our friends in Ukraine. That's why, so, that's why I and so many others support Cory Gardner's bill, H.R. 6, bipartisan legislation, the Domestic Prosperity and Global Freedom Act, which would help clear the backlog of export applications currently at DOE. LNG export facilities are just one part of the larger infrastructure picture to make full use of our newfound energy advantage, and H.R. 6 is one bill that facilitates building these, this architecture of abundance. <clears throat> we are in the midst of a continued and comprehensive effort to review and update energy laws, many of which were written in a time of Jimmy Carter era price controls and scarcity, and whether it is legislation to modernize and update transmission and distribution infrastructure, legislation to maintain a diverse electricity portfolio generation with a continued role for coal, nuclear, and renewables, or legislation seeking to ensure that we have the tools in place to permit a new manufacturing renaissance, we are building a record and exploring opportunities at every level. Now, I know that DOE is beginning a similar effort to look comprehensively at our energy infrastructure and broader strategy through the quadrennial energy review process, and I welcome that broad look. However, I remain skeptical of the federal government playing venture capitalists and making other decisions best left to the marketplace. DOE may be talking about the energy breakthroughs of the future, but the agency is still trying to get there with central planning approaches of the past. In particular, the revival of the loan guarantee program that backed Solyndra and several other projects that went bust is of serious concern and will no doubt be a topic of discussion of today. I'd like to conclude just by reminding you of its DOE's role in the federal government. Yesterday, this subcommittee held its EPA budget hearing, and I couldn't help but notice the extent to which EPA sets the energy policy agenda in the administration, even though that agency has no statutory authority to do so. DOE should be the energy policy setting body, but it seems as though it has relinquished that duty to a degree. In past administrations, both Republican and Democratic, DOE acted as a pro-energy counterweight to an EPA whose tendency was to regulate every BTU that it encountered. I know that we can restore DOE's mission to ensure a more balanced approach to the energy policy, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Upton yields back the balance of his time. At this time, <clears throat> I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome back to our committee. Last week, uh, geochemist James Lawrence Powell published a study documenting the scientific consensus on climate change. Dr. Powell, who, among other things, served on the National Science Board under both Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush, looked at all the peer-reviewed scientific articles publish, published on climate change in 2013. He found over 10,000 articles that agreed that climate change is real and caused by man, and only two out of more than 10,000 that rejected human-caused global warming. You can see his results on the screen. 
Secretary Moniz, you may not know this, but we took a vote on this issue earlier this year. Congresswoman Schakowsky offered an amendment that said greenhouse gas emissions threaten public health and welfare by disrupting the climate. That was the statement. The Republican members of this committee voted unanimously to reject that amendment. Just that statement. I have been con in Congress for 40 years. This is my last year in Congress. And I have never seen such an embarrassing and dangerous disconnect between what scientists say and how this committee votes. On Monday, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, told us that climate change is happening today on, quote, all continents across the oceans, end quote. The world's leading scientists explain that unless we take significant steps to reduce carbon pollution now, quote, climate change impacts are projected to slow down economic growth, make poverty reduction more difficult, further er erode food security, and prolong existing and create new poverty traps, end quote. The science of climate change is settled. Climate change is happening. It is caused by humans, and its impacts are both serious and real. And it's time for us to listen to the scientists and to act. I appreciate that we have a president who does listen to the scientists and is acting to address climate, climate dangers. Under his climate action plan, President Obama has committed to reducing our carbon pollution by 17 percent by 2020 and has outlined a number of steps to do so. The President has committed to bend the post-2020 global emissions trajectory further still. The Department of Energy has a key role to play under the President's plan. The energy choices we make today will determine whether we address this threat or leave our children and grandchildren with a climate catastrophe. That means, Secretary Moniz, that you have one of the most important jobs in America. I view the paramount responsibility of the Secretary of Energy as advancing the nation's res response to the threat of climate change. That's your responsibility as well as EPA's. And I don't think you ought to be fighting a turf war with them, as some of our colleagues here suggest. Under your leadership, the Department of Energy is working to meet the climate challenge. DOE is developing the energy efficiency standards we need to cut energy waste and save people money. You're engaged in research, development, demonstration, and deployment of advanced renewable energy technologies, cleaner vehicles, energy storage, and a modern electric grid that delivers reliable, clean energy to power our homes and businesses. And you're hard at work developing next generation pollution control technologies for our fossil fuel systems. These new clean energy technologies will protect our environment, create new jobs, and grow our economy. Mr. Secretary, the latest IPCC report confirms that we have a choice. We can listen to the scientists and invest in the energy technologies we need for a prosperous, clean energy future, or we can ignore the climate problem and suffer dire consequences. Mr. Secretary, I'm confident that you will continue to help us choose the right path to a clean energy future. I look forward to your testimony and your continued leadership on these issues. Thank you. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. At this time, having completed the opening statements, uh, Secretary Moniz, uh, we're going to recognize you for your five-minute opening statement. And once again, thank you for being with us. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I should say Chairman uh, Whitfield and Upton and Rush and Waxman, uh, members of the committee, uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come here to discuss our uh, budget proposal for uh, fiscal year 15. Uh, the President, I think, made clear through this proposal that uh, the Department of Energy has significant uh, responsibilities uh, in the advancing the nation's uh, security, uh, by main especially by maintaining a reliable nuclear deterrent uh, and keeping nuclear materials uh, out of the hands of terrorists, uh, and for adv advancing the nation's prosperity, uh, in particular by supporting the President's uh, all the above approach to energy and by helping to provide the foundation for the future of advanced manufacturing in this country. 
Mr. Secretary, if I may, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Would you move the microphone just a little bit closer to you? Oh, closer? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, the Department of Energy's uh, uh, top line uh, discretionary budget request uh, is $27.9 billion, a 2.6 percent increase uh, from FY14. Uh, and in this constrained budget environment, again, I think this reflects uh, some of the high priority missions that we, we have responsib uh, responsibility for. I will discuss very briefly uh, a few points uh, along DOE's three major programmatic areas uh, as we have organized them at the undersecretary level, science and energy, which I understand will be the main focus uh, of, of today's discussions, and a few words about nuclear security and management and performance. On science and energy, uh, the President's uh, all the above energy strategy uh, is driving economic growth and creating jobs uh, while lowering uh, carbon emissions. We are producing more gas, more natural gas in the United States than ever before. And for the first time in two decades, we are producing uh, more oil at home than we import from the rest of the world. In fact, just yesterday, uh, the uh, EIA uh, released some data uh, showing that net energy imports in the United States uh, now, which is about 13 quads, uh, is the same as in 1987, 30 years ago. So it has been a dramatic uh, reduction uh, and, in fact, more than a 10 percent reduction just from, from 2012 to 2013. Uh, we have also at the same time made remarkable progress in clean, clean and renewable energy. In the last five years, more than double the amount of electricity from wind and solar, at the same time making the investments that enable coal and nuclear power uh, to be competitive uh, in a clean energy economy. We are aggressively advancing energy efficiency. Uh, bringing uh, economic, environmental, and security benefits. In the last few years, uh, we have seen technologies like LED lighting uh, costs drop sevenfold, uh, a, a several fold, excuse me, uh, such that payback periods are now uh, approaching uh, one year. So, uh, and along with that, tens of millions of units being, being deployed in the marketplace. The budget request is $9.8 billion, as the Chairman said, uh, for the science and energy activities, an increase of 5 percent. Um, uh, for, again, advancing the all-the-above energy strategy, supporting the Climate Action Plan, continuing the Quadrennial Energy Review, uh, focusing on energy infrastructure, and maintaining global scientific leadership. There are significant increases in several important applied programs. I will just say a couple of words. Uh, in energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, a, a 22 percent increase is proposed uh, with focus areas in transportation, uh, uh, renewable technology, efficiency, advanced manufacturing. Office of Electricity, uh, significant increase to support uh, what we all see, I think, as important modernization of the grid and enhancement of its resiliency in response to many threats uh, that we are, we are seeing. Uh, we are also building a strengthened emergency response capability as the lead ag agency for energy infrastructure uh, under the leadership of FEMA in case of, of severe events. ARPA-E, uh, which takes a unique entrepreneurial approach, uh, we propose uh, for a 16 percent increase. We would note that in its relatively brief uh, existence so far, there have been 24 startups coming out of ARPA-E programs and many, many other indicators of success. Uh, we also have created, uh, as part of our reorganization, the Office of Energy Policy and Systems Analysis, mainly gathering uh, policy elements from various program offices, but with a particularly critical uh, responsibility for enhancing our analytical capacity and for advancing the Quadrennial Energy Review, looking at this country's energy infrastructure challenges. Uh, DOE science programs uh, really are the backbone of the American research enterprise in the physical sciences, and we have proposed $5.1 billion uh, for science. As one example, in conjunction with the NNSA, our national security organization, uh, the Office of Science will lead uh, an initiative to develop exascale computing platforms, uh, the next stage in a historic DOE role for keeping this country at the leadership uh, edge of, uh, of high performance computing. And of course, the many facilities that science uh, supports light sources, spallation neutro neutron source, the future facility for rare isotope beams all sustain nearly 30,000 scientists in this country with cutting edge, uh, cutting edge uh, activities. Uh, I mentioned uh, cross cutting activities already, exascale, uh, for example, grid, uh, one other one, subsurface science and engineering where we find many energy issues involve subsurface science and engineering. We want to pull those together, 
make them more coherent, involve our laboratories as a system. And um, in nuclear security, I'll just uh, end up by saying we've uh, asked for $11.9 billion. I would say a high point there is that through an administration-wide uh, process, uh, we have firmly committed to the nuclear posture review approach to our nuclear deterrent, uh, and that is stretched out a little bit because of budget constraints, but is committed to as our direction uh, there. Um, uh, in management and performance, uh, just emphasizing, uh, and I think this committee would agree, that if uh, without improving our management and performance, uh, we will not be able to as effectively, for sure, execute our energy science and security missions. So this is a brand new, a new focus uh, under which we have moved environmental management uh, to be a specific responsibility of that, of that undersecretary. I'll just mention maybe from the point of view of a news item, again, uh, as, you, as you know, uh, we've, had a, we've had an issue at WIP, uh, our uh, facility in New Mexico. I just wanted to say that, uh, emphasize first that there is no evidence of any significant uh, exposures uh, to, to people, but obviously we are shut down at the moment. But yesterday, uh, two teams uh, did enter uh, the, uh, the caverns, uh, and we hope to uh, move expeditiously uh, towards a, a reopening. With that, um, I just want to thank you for your, for your time, um, and I look forward to, to questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, once again, we appreciate your being here. Uh, at this time, I will recognize myself for five minutes of questions. And while there are uh, many broader policy uh, concerns uh, that I have, I do want to focus uh, initially on uh, the Paducah gaseous diffusion plant because there are so many. It's going through a transition down there. And uh, w one question I would like to ask you is uh, this communi of course, communication between the State of Kentucky the City of Paducah and the Department of Energy is vitally important. And with all the changes taking place, uh, the Paducah site has not really had a director or a lead that's really focused on that one area on site. And we've had some previous discussions about this, but could, could you share with us this morning whether or not you all do intend to appoint a person that would be responsible for that site? and be responsible for a, a good communication with the community and the state. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, I've appreciated uh, also your intercession in helping us with those communications uh, with the city and, 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 the, uh, and the state. Uh, uh, my understanding is that we are in the process of hiring that person. Uh, I will, why don't I get back and, and check exactly on the status of that and, and get, get back to you promptly. But you do feel like I mean, we we will we it, we do want to have a a dedicated okay. site manager at Paducah. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Now the FY14 budget uh, for the Paducah area, the cleanup and everything was around 265 million dollars, and it's my understanding that not all of that money is going to be able to be spent this year. But it's my understanding that the Department of Energy would have the option of directing some of that additional money for cleanup. And as you know, with USEC coming to an end, a lot of people are losing their jobs down there. Uh, could the Department of Energy, or are you all considering funneling some of that money for additional cleanup so that some of these people would be able to retain those jobs? Well, we are, uh, Mr. Chairman, we're, we are working to uh, try to speed up the contract uh, uh, discussions. Um, uh, typically, these large environmental management contracts, they're complicated, they're very long term, they have very, very large contract amounts, uh, are 12 to 14 months. Uh, we're hoping to get that down a little bit shorter so that we can have that turnover uh, uh, early in the fall, uh, and we're working hard on that. Uh, that's, I think, the reason why we anticipate uh, having some carryover funds. Uh, we're trying to exercise what we can uh, this year. I understand the, the concerns, but we will have carryover funds uh, for, for sure. So I think also in the context of our FY15 request, I think we will have a, a strong program. But, but when you are you're referring to the IDIQ contract? Yeah. That, that, uh, and, and did I understand you to say that in September or did you Se get September ish is what we are, we, are, we are trying to push to to get that contract uh, concluded. Okay. Well, of course, that remains a priority for 
all of us involved with this issue, so I, we do appreciate your uh, focusing on it and expediting it as, as much we, as possible. We were able to beat the schedule last year on another issue. Right. Hopefully we can beat the schedule this year, but uh, we're, we're, we're trying. And also in the FY 2015, there's talk in the budget about transitioning the facility into, into a cold and dark state. And of course, we don't want it to be a cold and dark state because we were more interested in de de decontamination and decommissioning of the facility. But your understanding, what is the definition of a cold and dark state for a facility well, I, like that? Well, I can't say that I have, uh, to be honest, uh, really focused on that. But I would say that um, it means I think we need to have the facility in a, um, in a stable, safe uh, uh, condition. Um, uh, without compromising the eventual D and D activities, though those would be the objectives right. at least. I can't say that I could describe in technical right. detail what it right. means. But it is the goal to to decontaminate and decommission rather than leave. Certainly, it in a cold oh yeah, that, that that's that is certainly a requirement. Absolutely. Yes. Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you for helping clarify some of those issues. I appreciate that very much. And uh, I don't know how much time you have. We may go to a second round if you have time, but. This time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes of question, Mr. Rush. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. I, I do have a lot of questions that I want to cover, and I know I won't have the time uh, to do it all this morning. So, I will be submitting questions for the record, and I'd like the agency to get back to me uh, as promptly as possible. Two of the issues that I want to discuss today are both the Minorities and Energy Initiative, and also the publicly funded national research labs. Uh, of the agency's $27.9 billion budget request, what is the amount allocated to the Office of Econ uh, Economic Impact and Diversity, which is the agency primarily responsible for enacting the Minorities in Energy Initiative, uh, both in terms of dollars uh, and also in terms of percentage? Uh, do, do you feel that this amount is adequately uh, uh, in terms of reflection, reflecting the priorities of reaching out and engaging minorities uh, in the energy sector uh, for both you and for uh, President Obama? And uh, can you do more? So those are three questions. Well, first of all, I think the, um, the budget for the uh, Economic um, Development Diversity Office is, I believe it's approximately $6 million. Uh, it, in the budget, I just want to clarify that in the budget, it, it shows a decrease, but it's not actually a decrease because two functions um, were uh, uh, placed elsewhere. Uh, one is by law, um, we, uh, we had to move the uh, OSDEBU office, uh, <laughs> I forgot the name, uh, office of small, it's a small business uh, uh, office. Um, I, uh, I, the acronym, uh, I've forgotten now what it stands for. But uh, by statute, uh, it turned out we had to move that outside and leave it as a coordinating office with, with, with the ED office under Dot Harris. Uh, the second thing is that there was a function placed in there, which the office was paying for, uh, for the department-wide ombudsman which was really misplaced. So we put that in the management and administration office as, as a better place. So the, the, core, the budget for that office really is, is not, has not been, been, been cut. So in, in, the, in your best estimates, then the, the, the budget is flat flatlined to a, to a great flat line. It's, it's, I, I believe it's, it's not increased, I believe it's not flat. increased. Is that what you're saying? Flat. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's correct. And, and uh, if, I, if I go on to discuss the Minorities and Energy uh, Initiative, and I, by the way, I do want to say that you know the the birth of that was in a hearing here last June <laughs> when you ra when you raised the issue. Right. Um, uh, I think it's it's off to a very very successful uh, start um, uh, with the ambassadors. You know that very well, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Mr. Rush. The uh, for, but for example, uh, and this is not on our budget, but for example, uh, the American Petroleum Institute, because of the initiative, and its director is one of the ambassadors. They, have, they are having eight regional meetings to attract minorities into the oil and gas industry workforce. Yeah. 
Uh, I personally went in the end of January to Hampton University uh, and recruited the president, uh, uh, Mr. Harvey, to, uh, to an ambassadorship. But, uh, so we are promoting this. Uh, I think Mr. Secretary, uh, can you do more? Uh, I, we, we can do more and, and be happy to, to discuss with you how we could do more. All right. Moving on to the area of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the publicly funded national research labs. How many publicly funded national research, research labs are there? And are any of these labs managed by uh, or operated by a minority? Uh, we have 17, uh, 17 national laboratories. Uh, the, uh, Are there any of them operated by a minority? Uh, well, uh, the, I mean, they're, they're operated by organizations. Uh, the, uh, let me say that I am dissatisfied, uh, frankly, with the um, diversity in the upper management ranks of these laboratories, and that's something that we have taken up with would our lab you, policy council. Yeah, would you speak specifically about Argonne and Fermi, which are located in my home state, Argonne and Fermi, which are located in my home state. What are the percentages of minority engagements uh, at Argonne and Fermi uh, Lab? Uh, sir, I'd have to get back to you with that for the record because I don't know those, those uh, numbers. Do but you I do have? Know, a, I do know that the upper ranks of the of the management uh, are we have inadequate representation. Do you have figures for any other of the other seventeen labs across across the country? No, but I, I can, I can, I'd be happy to get you those, uh, those demographics. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. This time, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, um, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, you're the only um, cabinet secretary that goes longer between haircuts than me. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that. that I didn't, know, I didn't know I had to come here to get that repeated, but anyway. <laughs> no, I, I need a haircut, so uh, you make me look uh, sheared, so to speak. Um, I know this is a budget hearing, and um, I know we should be asking questions about the DOE budget, but I want to um, ask you a few more questions about uh, LNG exports, given what's happened in the Ukraine and Crimea. This uh, subcommittee has done a number of uh, forums where we've had almost uh, a complete panoply of foreign uh, representatives, and to a person, they've all said that they want the United States to export LNG, and they want to do it sooner rather than later. The uh, situation in the Ukraine obviously gives uh, uh, credence to that. Uh, I believe President Obama, when he was in Europe, last week or the week before last, um, made some comments that said that, that we should do that. Now, I don't want to say that as an absolute certainty because I, I don't remember exactly what he said. Um, your agency, your department, is the department that has to, to give the initial approval. Uh, you just approved one uh, on, I think, uh, February the 29th. So uh, if that's possible, did we have a February the 29th this year? Uh, any, in any event, Mar March. March, March, March 29th. Yeah. I knew you'd correct me, so you're right, March. March the 24th, actually. I was looking, anyway, it's my fault. Um, so it looks like when we read the approval documents that they're almost verbatim. Uh, and so my question is, once you've, found that it's in the public interest for one of these projects, why does it keep taking so long to approve the next one? There's still uh, 24 in the queue. Why couldn't we just get a big stamp and a stamp them all approved and, and get on with it? Well, there are a number of, of issues uh, there. Um, the, uh, first of all, we do, we do have these large dockets which do have uh, uh, specific uh, comments uh, with regard to uh, 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 different, uh, uh, different proposals. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, as you know, there's also the FERC process which uh, goes through the NEPA process uh, uh, on a site I'm aware of that. basis. And, uh, and, uh, you don't have to worry about that. And so that's not an excuse. Well, no, I'm, I'm saying, but it's, it's a fact. And, uh, and, and right now we have no proposals 
ready for that final final declaration because they're still in, they're still in the NEPA process. Um, uh, third uh, is that. But the why would that why would that impact the DOE process? I don't understand that. Somebody's getting ready to run for president in two years, but that doesn't impact my process of running for Congress this year. I mean. I, I don't understand why well, DOE well, we, going well, through, I mean, FERC going through the NEPA process makes well, we, we, it more we difficult cannot, for we you can, to we, give approval or disapproval. My understanding certainly is that we, we cannot act on, on a final approval until that, pro, that other pro, the FERC process is complete. But you can, you can do whatever you've been doing, this conditional approval. Yes, yeah, so the conditional approvals, uh, we, you've done uh, seven, we, we do prior uh, to the, uh, typically prior to the FERC process, although I might say that now, uh, I think as the process has, has rolled forward, we are seeing some proposers file with FERC prior to getting conditional approval. So this, this is an evolution that, that, is, that, that is happening. That's, that's, that, that's, that's great that's information, Mr. Secretary, yeah. but it's irrelevant to what your job is supposed to be. You've got 24 of these, and I'm not trying to be argumentative. I, I, I happen to believe that you and I are on the same page. Then, then, then All I want you to do is say, I agree with you. We're going to get on it. We need to do them more quickly. You're uh, right, Congressman. I, uh, That's uh, all you got to do, and the, then we go on to the next questioner. Um, I agree that we, we, need, we are uh, systematically uh, working through the, the applications. Uh, look, right now, the law requires us to do a public interest determination. Uh, that public interest determination has multiple features. All right. uh, My time has expired. You successfully filibustered the question no, period. It, I want you to do me one. Go back to your office this afternoon. It's that big office in the corner on the top floor of the Forrestal building, unless you've moved it. No. And read the seven applications that you've approved and give me a report on the any wording differentiation in any of those seven approvals. They're almost verbatim. I, I, would, I would note, for example, in the last approval, the Jordan Cove, uh, you will see a rather different discussion of international uh, impacts in the public interest determination, for example. The gentleman's time has expired. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from uh, California. Uh, no. Have you asked this question before? Where's Mr. Waxman? Who's next? This time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. Thank you for that reluctance, uh, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> um, Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you for coming this morning. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about fusion energy uh, for a few minutes, if you don't mind. Um, fusion energy, as you know, consists of releasing energy by fusing nuclei of small uh, elements together. Uh, and fusion uh, is the fuel for fusion energy would be virtually unlimited. Radioactive waste produced by fusion uh, reaction is less dangerous than uh, radioactive waste produced from nuclear power, uh, and fusion reactors would inherently be fail-safe in their operation. Do you agree with those statements? Well, uh, fail-safe in terms of certain kinds of accidents. Obviously, they, they can have malfunctions. Right. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, the DOE budget for fusion research is $416 million a year. Now, on the other hand, the fusion power supporters believe that fusion power could be practical in 10 years with a $3 billion investment per year. Do you believe that that's a realistic assessment? Um, I should probably insert at this point, so just I, I can answer that question, sure. but I am recused from dealing with the fusion program. Uh, and, uh, so there may be some of these I'll have to have my science office get back to you. But in terms of the, uh, the statement just now, in terms of a general uh, objective, uh, I think the 10-year estimate would certainly be viewed as optimistic by most uh, scientists. Okay. Well, if so, how long do you think it would take then uh, with the, with the, the 400 and... Um, I, I, I wouldn't the, speculate, but, but, uh, but for example, uh, what is certainly part of the public discussion, uh, again, I, can't, I cannot make decisional statements on fusion, uh, the... Um, uh, I believe the you know the major international project uh, currently going on uh, doesn't even plan to get to ignition in I don't know quite quite a few years uh, from now at, at least a decade so and that would be many steps from that to a commercial 
uh, plant. Okay, well, fair enough. Yeah. Um, do you think it's a, that's a good investment of American dollars in, in fusion research? In, as, again, as a, as a general statement, I think we definitely should keep uh, investing in fusion. Okay. We've fallen behind some of the other countries in that, in that research area uh, over the last decade or so. Well, again, I think as a, I'm just going to my scientific background, I would say that we remain the leaders in, in many aspects of, of fusion. I think certainly in the large-scale modeling and simulation of plasmas, I think we uh, remain uh, leaders. We are building many of the big components in terms of big magnets, superconducting magnets. So I, I think I think we we have uh, we're we're not so far behind. I, I would say in terms of our in terms of our capacity. Obviously, we don't have a facility of the scale that is being built in Europe. Okay, well, I'm going to change the subject a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, last week, the President announced an interagency methane strategy to reduce emissions of that potent greenhouse gas. DOE will play an important role, along with the EPA and uh, the Department of Interior. Um, the strategy document states that the DOE will sponsor roundtable discussions with stakeholders about methane emissions. Uh, what does the DOE hope to achieve in those roundtable discussions? Uh, I, just, I just might add it for the agencies, the U.S., uh, the agriculture is also a, a major player in that for different mm. sources of methane. Uh, the, um, uh, the Department of Energy, uh, uh, our, our focus is uh, on data, uh, and it's very much focused also on the kind of midstream and downstream uh, systems. We assembled, we had the first of the roundtables, uh, multiple constituencies, uh, um, uh, especially for that midstream and downstream, uh, including, you know, uh, companies, labor, environmental groups, et cetera. The big message for me in that meeting was the surprising degree of agreement in terms of a path forward uh, and how much actually companies are already doing in the context of renewing old infrastructure and simultaneously addressing methane leaks. Uh, are there particular technologies that the DOE would want to support in this area? Uh, for example, uh, we, uh, we very much uh, want to keep pushing, and ARPA-E uh, will be pursuing this, uh, uh, really uh, high-quality, lower-cost detectors and sensors so that we can know wh where the leaks are. Performance-based standards. Right. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. This time, recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you having the hearing, and uh, Secretary Mundy, appreciate you being here to talk about the uh, the department's budget and obviously the uh, the policies that then go into uh, the, the funding that would come from that that budget. When I look at your budget, you're requesting a seven hundred and fifteen million dollar increase uh, over where you currently are. You know, obviously, we're we're trying to to get control over spending in Washington. Washington's spending more than we take in. We're we're actually trying to to go department by department uh, to actually start trying to get Washington to live within its means, meaning to spend less than it's taking in, uh, less than it's spending right now because it spends more than it takes in. So uh, when you ask for a 700. In fifteen million dollar increase, I know. Look at some of the agencies, and you have a twenty-two percent increase you're requesting uh, for renewable energy, and we're already spending a lot of money. It's not like there's not money being spent on renewable energy. This committee's had a lot of hearings on on some of those those boondoggles, things like Solyndra uh, and others. And and when when you look at a request like this, and you're asking for seven hundred fifteen million more, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred and fifty million or more of that money is going to have to be borrowed from countries like China. I mean, do you factor that in when you're asking us for, for this kind of increase, uh, that, that a large portion of that is, is money? It's not just sitting around somewhere. It's literally money that's going to be borrowed uh, with that bill being sent to our kids. Well, uh, first of all, I, I do not subscribe to the boondoggle. Uh, we can come back to that. But uh, it wasn't a good with, expenditure. With, with, regard, with regard to the budget, uh, uh, clearly the administration budget uh, uh, is consistent with the uh, the the Marty Ryan budget. Uh, so it it it's, it it obeys the the, the cap. Uh, it's essentially flat dollars from FY14. Uh, within that overall budget, the president chose to. Uh, give greater emphasis to some, some some of our programs, both in energy and in nuclear security. 
And I know we talked about this yesterday at a separate hearing, but uh, you know, the Secretary of State had made comments that, uh, that, that global warming and this, this, this climate change agenda is a bigger threat to America than terrorism. I, I, would, I would dispute that. I don't know, I uh, won't ask you for that uh, reaction. But I, I do want to ask because you did touch on the, uh, the President's uh, supposed all of the above energy strategy, and I know your agency's tasked with coming up with a strategy uh, for the country. Uh, when we talk about the President's approach to energy, uh, you know, I know he talks about all of the above, but when you look at the numbers, it just doesn't back up what he says. And specifically, I want to talk about energy production on federal lands. Uh, I was able to get this information from the American Enterprise Institute. They, they do some really good research uh, on a lot of fronts, but on energy production, they actually uh, have charted uh, how uh, per, this is an actual change in fossil fuel production over the years. And so uh, they're showing, you know, especially when you look from 2009 to today, a dramatic increase in production on state and private lands, which I know the president likes taking credit for. But when it comes to areas where the federal government actually has authority, on federal lands you have a 15 percent decrease. Uh, so you have a dramatic difference in how our, our energy portfolio is playing out in the real world, uh, you're seeing state and private land production dramatically up. But on federal lands, because of this administration's policies, uh, you actually see a dramatic decrease in energy production. And so when the president talks about an all of the above strategy, he's, he's not carrying that out in his policies. His policies are actually hurting production on federal lands. Fortunately, we've got private uh, private lands and, and states that are making up the difference, but the federal government's going after them too. So I want to ask you, when it comes to this, this idea of an all of the above strategy, which I fully embrace, President Obama does not embrace, and the numbers back that up. When you see some of his other agencies, like EPA uh, and Department of Interior, de facto carrying out a different strategy, how much interaction do you have as Secretary of Energy trying to push for an energy strategy on one hand, but then having agencies like the EPA trying to shut some of that production down. Uh, do you all try to coordinate and say, hey, we want an all of the above strategy, and if you really mean it, are you going to agencies like EPA and saying, stop this war on coal that's killing jobs, uh, killing energy, uh, stop this war on, uh, you know, they're attempting to have a war on hydraulic fracturing uh, to shut some of that down. I mean, do you all, do you all have any interaction on that? Uh, we certainly do. Uh, I'd like to uh, note, first of all, that uh, I feel we do have an all of the above strategy, and it's a very strong one. And what do you uh, say about the, these numbers? Though? And, and if the I numbers may, don't back it up. So, if I may make two comments, sure. uh, sir, uh, respectfully. Uh, the uh, uh, first, uh, the investments in these different areas, it's not only these discretionary numbers in the FY15 budget. If you look at look at coal, uh, we have six billion dollars in CCS projects uh, that that are that are coming on. Uh, we have an eight billion dollar loan guarantee uh, program for fossil energy uh, across the board. We just did a loan for nuclear. Uh, the uh, you're talking about and, money, but and, I'm talking about the results. And the results are that production's down on federal and, lands. Do and you if you look at that, that? that specific issue, uh, I might observe that a major driver of that is geology. The Do you dispute that it's down? Production's down on federal lands. No, the, those are data. Right. That's However, right. unconventional reservoirs are not in the traditional areas. The, the market has moved to the Marcellus Shale, to the Eagleford, to the Bakken. And so is the That's EPA. why they're there. Yeah, and time. I know I'm out of time. Right. I appreciate that. This and time, uh, you'll back to balance. This time, time I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Moniz, that was an interesting line of questioning. It was more trying to provoke you. Um, are we not following an all above strategy? Seems to me you were outlining a lot of different areas where we're pursuing energy development. I assume that development on public lands is just a small part of the overall energy uh, areas that we're considering. Well, and, and, and that's, so yes, I, so uh, bottom line, yes, we are for pursuing an all of the above strategy. Uh, and I think uh, our, our, our energy system uh, is, is showing it, even as we have reduced carbon emissions at the same time. I, I tend to think that the Republicans don't want an all of the above. They want a strategy to continue to rely on fossil fuels, especially coal. When we talk about the war on coal, I, I just can't understand this argument of the war on coal. Coal is losing out not because of any government actions. It's losing out because of market forces. Utilities are finding it less expensive to use natural gas. and uh, uh, And even though we subsidize coal but not requiring them to pay for the external cost of uh, their use of cheap coal, 
they, they can't compete uh, at the present time. But they are also the leading source of carbon emissions. I mentioned in my opening statement the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, their report should be a wake-up call. Uh, everyone uh, is, uh, the world's leading scientists are telling us everyone is going to be impacted by climate change. No country or region is immune. If we listen to our scientists and invest in the clean energy technologies that will put our country and the world on the path to a sustainable and prosperous energy future, uh, that seems to be the course we should be taking not just no action, which is what we hear more often than not from the leadership on this committee. Uh, as a scientist, I'd like to ask you about the consequences of inaction. Last year, DOE examined the impacts of climate change and what it would mean for energy infrastructure as a result of higher temperatures, drought, sea level rise, extreme weather events. What did DOE find? I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Well, I want to know what DOE found in terms oh, of the impact uh -huh. of climate change on energy infrastructure. Uh -huh. Yes. So the, uh, the, uh, the risks and, and vulnerabilities report that you're referring to uh, certainly uh, lays out uh, rather dire consequences uh, for our energy infrastructure. Uh, the, I might add the President uh, in the Climate Action Plan, of course, elevated uh, adaptation and resilience of energy infrastructure uh, to a very high level precisely anticipating what the report said this week, that we are seeing the consequences and they're going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And prudence requires us both to try to mitigate further, further uh, consequences. But let me ask you, if we have sea well. levels rising right. and floods and storms and wildfires, that'll, that's going to put coastal and inland energy facilities at risk, among others. others. Droughts will impair power plant cooling systems, increase mm -hmm. the risk of shutdowns. Higher temperatures will put stress on our electricity systems and reduce the efficiency of generation and transmission infrastructure. If all those things happen, aren't we talking about an all of the above strategy of ignoring climate change at our own peril? Yes, and they, they, they've all happened already. We have had power plants shut down because of uh, warmer, warmer waters, for example. In the West, the climate change is expected to decrease the amount of snowpack, and we're already seeing in recent years in California a problem. What effect is that going to have on water availability for energy generation, agriculture, and drinking water? Uh, it would be a tremendous impact, and again, it's already there. We're, we're seeing it. With the, the, the Colorado River, as you know very well, uh, is in a um, very difficult situation <laughs> after years of drought. Uh, climate change is going to impact everyone, but it won't impact everyone equally. Some in the coal industry are engaged in a publicity campaign to convince Americans that the key to addressing poverty in the world's poorest countries is to get them to use coal. Uh, I find this deeply cynical. In fact, uh, Secretary Moniz, didn't the IPCC find that poor people and poor countries will be hit hardest by climate change and wouldn't uncontrolled burning of coal exacerbate these impacts? Well, uh, increased carbon emissions in general would, of course, and, uh, and you're certainly correct that the poorest societies are the most, most vulnerable. Well, it just strikes me that uh, we are whistling past the graveyard when we hear people talking about how the war on terrorism is something that we ought to pay more attention to than climate change. You know, you've got to pay attention to problems. And the big, huge problem that is being ignored on this committee is the problem of climate change, and I hope that will change because we do have a we do have a choice to make. Thank you, Mr. I agree, Mr. Secretary. Gentlemen's time has expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and Mr. Secretary. I thank you for being here. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, I want to touch on what's going on in Russia and the Ukraine a bit. Uh, and off a little bit from what we've been talking about, but what I know that crisis is, must have influenced your decision uh, in making with respect to LNG exports, and I understand that Russia has recently raised the price of natural gas to Ukraine by 40 percent. It seemed like the Chairman of Energy and Commerce touched on that a moment ago. Uh, do you think at what point are, are delays going to deny the private sector the ability to export LNG negatively? How does that impact job creation here in our country? 
Well, uh, sir, again, the, uh, the public interest uh, determination that we are required to make by law uh, has us balancing various, uh, various factors. Uh, the international situation is certainly one of them, uh, and that was noted in our uh, last uh, Jordan Cove conditional approval. Uh, but, uh, but also, of course, uh, very paramount is the impact on domestic markets and manufacturing. Uh, and, uh, and as you know, the many in the manufacturing community uh, remain very concerned about uh, not about having no exports, but about going too fast. So we're, we are in a situation of balancing that. Uh, uh, we have to look at the, cum at the cumulative impacts of, of, of exports. I might add, it, it, you know, there is this view of somehow uh, not doing enough or something, but I might or, add or delays. That, but I might add that the, the, so far the conditional approvals, again, we all know the gas will not flow for several years yet, uh, except for the first project. But the, the amount of approval so far, 9.3 billion cubic feet per day, is almost equal to the amount currently exported by, by far the world's biggest exporter, gutter. So what we've approved already uh, puts us essentially at the top of the, uh, of the export list. So this is not a small amount. Well, I want to get back to the offshore situation. On, in December 2012, Congress passed and, and our president signed into law the Deepwater Ports Act. Uh, contained authority for DOE to create a similar and a simultaneous process for offshore projects that would be permitted uh, under the Department of Transportation Maritime Administration, not FERC, uh, and the land-based projects uh, would continue under FERC. But from what I've been told, and I guess what I understand, the DOE is not complying with the 2012 law change allowing non-FERC offshore projects. Is that true? Well, I don't believe so, but I will look into this, Mr. Hall. Um, uh, certainly, I know there's a, there's a different process using MARAD. Uh, and if there is, what, what seems to be the holdup? Um, my understanding is that, and, and again, I will have to get back to you on this in detail. I'm, I'm sorry, right, I uh, think, but I, I, think I, the, uh, I think they're just... If you would do that, that I, I, I will do that, yes. I don't know how much time. I can't see that sign too good. But I've heard from companies that are ready for their permits to be approved and would be able to export LNG this year. They have global customers just waiting for these projects to move forward, I'm told. And the sooner we do this, Mr. Secretary, the better it's going to be for our, our economy, I think. And the faster we can provide stability in uneasy parts of the world like the Ukraine that I mentioned to start with, uh, I'd appreciate you also looking into that and giving me some information on it. Yeah. I'll yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, may I just yeah. add a, well, may I com was one comment on that? Yes, sir, uh, please. Just, just to note that uh, in a certain sense, <laughs> we've, we have already had some uh, kind of shadow exports in the sense that, as you well know, five, six years ago, there was the expectations of major LNG imports to the United States are not having those imports has had those cargoes go elsewhere, including to Europe. And we have European allies that are losing their bargaining power with Russia. Yeah. Uh, last week, in fact, it was announced in, in Europe, uh, and yesterday, and uh, Tuesday, the Wednesday, what's today? <laughs> yesterday, there was a meeting in Brussels, uh, and we are going to have a meeting of the, under the G7 of energy ministers to look at our collective energy security. Right. I thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. This time I recognize the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your tremendous leadership over at DOE. I'm very pleased to see the administration's uh, request for an increase in the Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy Account. While I know you were just criticized for that, I, for one, am very pleased with that outcome um, for many reasons, including the promising opportunities for clean energy, improvements in energy efficiency, domestic manufacturing, and certainly for modernizing the grid and making it more secure and resilient. One of the key technologies that will enable much of this is, of course, energy storage. I firmly believe if we can make better batteries and in energy storage systems, we will advance in many of the areas uh, more expeditiously uh, in those areas that I've just mentioned. I know this area of research and development is part of the vehicles technology work at uh, the Department of Energy. 
uh, <clears throat> and that you are doing it very well. How close are we to getting energy storage systems that will enable us to rely more heavily uh, with uh, the opportunity for storage with our solar and wind power? Well, if I start with the vehicle storage that, that you mentioned, uh, we should note that uh, costs uh, per kilowatt of storage have dropped by a factor of two in about four years, uh, uh, which is very encouraging. Uh, we need another factor of two or three uh, to really get to the cost point of a major commercial market, uh, although we are seeing tremendous progress. We did have more, uh, almost 100,000 uh, plug-in hybrid sales uh, last year, for example, double 2012. Mm -hmm. So that's looking very promising uh, over the next, say, 10 years. Uh, on utility-scale storage, uh, we do have, uh, we produced a report, uh, if you haven't seen it, we'd be happy to provide it, uh, on utility-scale storage um, a few months ago. Um, let's get that to you if you haven't seen it. Um, the, uh, uh, we have a ways to go to, to reach the cost points uh, that, 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 one, that one will need. We did have a budget, we, so we have a budget increase request for FY15. Right. And I know that GE in my district is working on advanced battery manufacturing that will address yes. uh, storage capacity for renewables. Does DOE have some demonstration projects underway with these systems? I'm, I'm not personally aware, but I, uh, I will check back on that. Uh, I, I'm just not, not, not aware. Mr. Okay. As you well know, the uh, electric generation and transmission systems that make up the grid are undergoing tremendous changes due to many factors, including an increased deployment of distributed generation, retirement of old generating plants, shifts in the, in the areas with electricity demand, and certainly shifts in fuel mix, to name a few. I believe energy storage could play an important role in a newly designed grid that is more flexible, resilient, and efficient. But these developments will also challenge the traditional financing model for utilities. Is the Department looking at both the technical and non-technical barriers to deployment of clean energy technologies and the challenges that, uh, the challenge that's presented uh, to our current grid infrastructure and traditional financing models? Yes, that's a very important point. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we are looking at this in a number of ways. In particular, again, this quadrennial energy review is, for this year, it's entirely focused on the uh, transmission, storage, and distribution of energy, both electricity and fuels. Uh, it's a key issue. Clearly, uh, there's technology involved uh, with the grid, uh, making phaser measurements, et cetera, but a lot of it is uh, policy, uh, including state policy, uh, as to how, how one does that. Uh, the other th point I would mention is, and again, you're completely uh, on, on the mark as far as I'm concerned, is uh, business models uh, are challenged uh, in, uh, uh, as, we, as we look forward to distributed generation, smarter grids, but also, I might add, the anticipation that we will continue to have no or very, very modest demand growth uh, as, as our efficiency uh, actions uh, take hold. And so we do have to also, we're trying to think through uh, how do we uh, see a transformation happening in a period of, let's say, flat demand. Mm -hmm. In your testimony, you also talked about the impact on the utilities with experiences like Hurricane Sandy in New York. Given our recent experiences and the prospect of more storms of this type as a result of climate change, this is something the administration sees as a key component of climate adap adaptation? Absolutely. Uh, and um, uh, we have in our budget, in fact, uh, a proposals for uh, increasing our emergency response capacity uh, that we exercise under, under FEMA. Uh, that would include, um, uh, for example, setting up an emergency response room for energy infrastructure. Uh, and it also would entail, uh, we believe it would be a good investment to uh, have a, a DOE a, a person assigned to each of the FEMA regions uh, so that the energy issues are understood up front uh, and that can cut time out from, from any, any response uh, to an emergency. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I thank, thank you, you for your efforts. Mr. Chair, I yield back. This time I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, on July 31st of last year, you testified before this committee and you said, and I quote, we have made very clear we follow the law. The law will be determined by this court decision that we are all awaiting. And if it directs the NRC to pick up the license, we will do our job to support that given appropriations, end of quote, your quotation. 
On November 19th of last year, the D.C. Circuit Court observed that the DOE is not, is not following the law, noting that DOE's current strategy, and I quote, is based on assumptions directly contrary to the law, close quote. The court ordered you to, and I quote, submit to Congress a proposal to change the fee to zero until such a time as either the secretary, that's you, chooses to comply with the act as it is currently written or until Congress, that's us, enacts an alternative waste management plan, close quote. Does the administration have any plans to resume work on Yucca Mountain and comply with the law, which is the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, as it is currently written? Well, first, of course, we did submit the letter to the Congress on, I think, January 3rd. Well, the, uh, the question the, is, the, does the administration have any plans to resume work on Yucca Mountain and comply with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act as it is currently written? As it is currently written. Yes. Secondly, uh, what, what's uh, the answer? In terms of the uh, the court decision with the NRC, of course, uh, they uh, they have resumed their activity. We are supporting that, uh, as I said, we would. Uh, so uh, we will, in fact, probably have our technical. Well, I'm going to follow through because I think we've got questions and testimony and your budget submission that that adequately proves that you are not complying and following with the law. The administration's budget indicates a need for legislation to carry out your DOE strategy for spent nuclear fuel management, especially considering it is based on assumptions directly contrary to law. Is the administration going to propose legislation? Uh, I, would, I would have to go consult with my colleagues on that. I am not aware of anything at the moment. So let me get this straight. The administration doesn't like the existing law and is choosing not to execute it. So the administration wants Congress to write a new law that it might like better but won't propose to Congress what that new law should look like. And in the meantime, you want to keep spending taxpayers' money on your strategy even after the D.C. Circuit Court noted that it is based upon assumptions directly contrary to law and has directed DOE, that's you, to stop collecting the nuclear waste fees from electricity consumers. If the administration won't follow the law on the books, why should we have any confidence that you will follow a new law? The first, I would like to note that, as was stated publicly uh, in a Senate hearing, uh, I did, in fact, work with uh, the committee in terms of shaping a uh, Mr. Secretary, a this is a budget hearing, and what and we're trying to find out is why you're not submitting money to comply with the law. And, and by not submitting money in your proposed budget, in conclusion, you are directing uh, your agency to not follow the law. If I may uh, uh, add, uh, the, uh, I'm also happy to work with those in this body uh, to uh, formulate um, uh, any, any bill. Secondly, uh, we have m uh, more than adequate funding right now to uh, do our, all, of, all the responses that might be called for uh, from the NRC to support their process. As I said, we expect our first report to be submitted uh, very soon, probably the end of this month. Uh, and third, our budget request uh, uh, is for all activities uh, which are authorized under the, uh, under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. In the context of DOE's assurances that it would follow the law, you, DOE, has repeatedly committed to this committee that DOE would honor the NRC's November 19th order, both in correspondence and in hearings, including your testimony that I noted earlier. As recently as January 9th letter to this committee, DOE stated it would honor NRC's request complete a groundwater supplement to Yucca Mountain EIS. However, on February 28th, you, DOE, notified NRC that it would not prepare the EIS supplement. Why did DOE change its mind over those seven weeks, and was your commitment to this committee even a factor in that decision? The, uh, uh, again, the, the core activity that we need to do for NRC is preparing uh, the, the updating the technical issues on, on groundwater. The, uh, the I have 15 seconds. Let me just go to a statement you have in your testimony. Yeah. You say, and a con consent-based siting. Where in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act is there a, the, any, the words anywhere, consent-based siting? Where is it in the law? Uh, I'd have to go back to my general counsel to Oh, come on, Mr. Secretary. You know I'd that consent-based siting is not in the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. And, and that's why your job is to comply with the laws of the land, and you continually thwart doing that. I yield back my time. 
what we believe we are complying. The gentleman's time has expired at this time. I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Moniz. Uh, welcome you back to our committee. I also want to thank you for your recent trip to Houston, speaking to uh, our Cerner Conference there. Uh, the budget we're discussing today has significant impact on the activities you witnessed in Houston. Uh, I want to start by asking you about pending LNG export applications. On March the 24th, the DOE approved the seventh non-FTA application for the Jordan Cove Energy uh, to be located on the West Coast. This approval came within six weeks after the approval of the Cameron location from Louisiana. Um, the, in October of 2013, the government was shut down for 17 days. The Department repeatedly stated that due to the shutdown, the operations of the agency was, was significantly slowed down. My first question is, is the Department fully recovered and staffed up from the delay, and does the FY15 budget include this? Uh, well, yes, we are we're fully, uh, okay. fully operational. Does the six-week approval of Jordan Code reflect this recovery? Well, e each, uh, each uh, license is, kind of, is a little bit different in terms of the timing, but I think if you look historically, you can see what the, what the timing has been post-shutdown. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Will the department continue to move at this pace? Well, again, I, I cannot make a prediction on any individual uh, application, but uh, our process, as you know, is, is, is well known. It's been very transparent. Uh, not, not everyone is uh, happy with it, apparently, but, uh, but it's, it's a pretty transparent process, and we've managed to now to get through, well, in my tenure, I think, five, uh, five of these uh, licenses. Once FERC issues the environmental assessment, what steps or analysis does the DOE take with respect to the final issuance of the non-FTA export permit? Well, when it comes back to the Department, um, uh, then uh, we obviously look at the NEPA statement. Uh, uh, there is a decision to be made as to whether any other analysis is, is required, uh, uh, but that's something that we haven't uh, faced yet, at least I haven't faced yet. Uh, but uh, So we are, we, we, are, we are expecting to get some of these NEPA analyses back from, uh, from FERC uh, this, this spring. Well, and you know the history of the, we first thought we were going to import LNG in 05, and now we're using that 05 law to export it, and there's some, con uh, I guess, some interest in expanding exporting, uh, and mm -hmm. there's legislation to consider it, but the department is actually, you know, approving these permits, and there'll still be a, I think the first one probably won't be able to export until sometime next year, which is a Chenier facility. And end, of, end of next year. End of next year. Mm -hmm. So even if we approved all these permits now, that natural gas, that LNG, probably wouldn't get to someone. Uh, and my concern is yesterday I met with uh, a number of German industrialists who would like to buy our natural gas. Uh, the problem is most of those permits that have been issued and the ones that are on the, in line are actually just contracted to send that LNG to Asia. And I asked them, I said, if y'all want to get in line, uh, you know, you don't build an LNG permit unless you can have some customers for it. And I know a lot of these companies would like to have the customers in Europe as well as Asia. So, uh, but anyway, I appreciate that. May, may, I, may I just comment? Uh, if I'm sure. Comment that, that the first license uh, that's granted the Chenier project that you mentioned uh, to export end of next year, they do have European companies. In fact, they just announced one with a, Euro a European company contracting for the volumes. But I want to emphasize European companies does not necessarily mean they will deliver the cargoes to Europe. Well, that's, th that's up to those companies to decide. That's true. Thank you. Um, <coughs> The carbon capture and storage is constantly discussed in the context of its use and the possibility to be used as carbon control technology under EPA rules for utilities and refiners. The problem is that it's still too expensive commercially to be used. This year, the department's budget was reduced uh, for carbon capture and storage by 40 percent. Does this reduced funding level indicate the department believes CCS is commercially viable? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, reach that that conclusion or or the opposite conclusion either. I mean, I think the uh, we are we are continuing to move forward uh, with these projects. The technologies, all the technologies have been have been used uh, in in a commercial context. Uh, clearly, as with any of the new technologies, renewables as well. Uh, our job is to continue to work on 
cost reduction f across the board. Well, and I think we probably disagree a little bit on commercially, uh, you know, cost effective, but, uh, but I know we would like to do it. Mr. Chairman, I, I have another question I'd like to submit on, uh, um, on American manufacturing, and, um, and I support that in the President's budget recommending a 69 percent increase in advanced manufacturing funding, um, and I would hope we could uh, have a response from the Department. It will be you. given to the Department time. for a response. At this time, recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Uh, I noted in the budget that the uh, lowest sub-agency or department, uh, lowest funded is the electric delivery and, and uh, energy reliability. And so could you give me quickly uh, the mission statement of that uh, sub-agency, electric delivery and energy reliability? It has two, uh, I would say, two principal uh, uh, roles. Uh, one is to uh, develop uh, and uh, and and in the Recovery Act period uh, to also deploy uh, critical technologies uh, for 21st century grid uh, grid modernization. Uh, so, for example, uh, they did a tremendous amount in terms of uh, uh, doing phase measurements to understand stability of the grid, working working with uh, with utilities and, and ISOs. Actually, the second uh, is the second area is the one uh, that I did mention earlier on, on strengthening emergency response capability. So the principal organization for our work on, emerg on emergency response under FEMA is in that office. Can you tell me how, uh, how this department or DOE then on reliability and delivery works with FERC and DO, uh, I'm sorry, EPA, or do they? Well, we, we obviously we all have different responsibilities. We certainly coordinate. Uh, uh, as an example, um, uh, Acting uh, Chairman uh, Lafleur from from FERC uh, uh, has come over twice for us to discuss the risks uh, that have been very prominent recently around physical uh, physical attacks yes. on infrastructure. And that's going to be my next question. Okay. Uh, but, so, uh, but how about so, with EPA? Uh, and with EPA, uh, we have. Uh, 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 many, uh, many discussions. Uh, uh, often what we do is provide uh, kind of technical underpinning, technical support in areas uh, that they are considering. We collaborate on things like the interagency methane strategy, et cetera. Yeah, the methane strategy is an interesting one, too. Uh, now, um, I, I will disagree with slightly uh, in part with uh, Mr. Waxman on uh, market forces being simply prices, because sometimes uh, energy feedstock sources are regional. For example, uh, Nebraska being a couple hour train ride uh, for Powder River Basin coal. Uh, and so therefore, Nebraska is heavily reliant on that level of coal. But it appears that some of the rules that the EPA is promulgating uh, would force some of those smaller, older power, uh, coal-fired power plants uh, to spend more than the building or facility is worth to change to natural gas or close. Uh, so I want, uh, want to know if uh, the electric delivery and energy reliability department sub-agency is working with EPA to figure out reliability when we have large gaps in uh, production electrical uh, generation in states like Nebraska if these rules become permanent? I would say that there are th three, um, three places in the Department that address these kinds of issues. I mean, right. one, of course, is EIA just on a purely data uh, uh, basis, uh, Office of Electricity, as, as we mentioned. But the third, uh, and in some sense uh, maybe the most active at the moment in the, the way you're, you're, you're mentioning, is the Energy Policy and Systems Ana Analysis Office, uh, because in, the, in this quadrennial energy review for which they play a key role, uh, this whole question of reliability and resilience 
of energy infrastructure is the focus area for this year. Okay. And, and in that regard, uh, and what happened in California, the department, uh, it, do they do a risk assessment on the vulnerability of the power grid, either by an, an attack that occurred out in California uh, or even at a higher level that seems to be the rage in a lot of TV shows, EMPs? Well, we have, um, uh, on the first part, we have, um, uh, we have worked together with uh, Homeland Security um, uh, and state agencies, uh, uh, the, the, the Deputy Secretary in particular. Uh, we have had 13 uh, regional meetings uh, to address the issues of physical security. Uh, we work with the utilities very closely. Uh, the utilities have done probably more than has been acknowledged in the, in the press uh, already, but there's a ways to go. Uh, uh, the last meeting was just, uh, the last of these meetings was just a week ago Friday, in fact, in, uh, in New York. That was the last of the 13 uh, uh, meetings. Um, EMPs uh, uh, is on the screen. The, uh, in, in our look at resiliency of infrastructure, uh, both electricity and fuels, uh, we are trying to start an, an ana analysis based on integrated sets of risks. So it's extreme weather, it's cyber, it's physical, it's EMPs, and it's the interdependencies of infrastructures as a risk in and of itself. <coughs> Yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Caps, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, to, uh, Secretary Moniz, for being here today for your testimony. Uh, I'm um, a longtime supporter of the Department of Energy's efforts to develop clean, renewable energy technologies. And of the many renewables out there, wind and solar are obviously the furthest along. But there are some other promising renewables in the works, including marine and hydrokinetic, or MHK, technologies. As you know, federal investments are crucial to advancing these technologies to commercial viability. And I'll quote the DOE, as you stated in your uh, 2015 budget justification. DOE plays a critical role in MHK technologies because of their nascent stage of development, which is similar to that of wind and solar technologies 20 years ago. I have three questions around this topic, uh, pretty specific or brief, if you will. Uh, could you expand upon this point briefly? Uh, why is DOE's involvement so important for developing these technologies at this early stage? Well, I think, as you said, as, as with others, uh, the early stage uh, is very hard to attract uh, 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 private, private sector funding, at least if it's not leveraged with some public funding. You can recall that I, um, perhaps I can, that I raised this issue with you last September during a hearing as well. And you responded by saying that DOE was looking for ways to increase support, just as you ju just did, for what you referred to as the, these re forgotten renewables, if you will. Given this perspective, I was puzzled to see a 25 percent decrease for MHK in DOE's budget request this year. This was particularly troubling when compared to the 20 percent increase for the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, EERE, office overall. So um, what's with this divergence? Um, why did the relatively small uh, MHK uh, budget get such a sharp reduction? Well, we, we, did, uh, we did increase in terms of the other renewables uh, yes. in geothermal and in water. Yes. Uh, within water, uh, the, what the program did was rebalance uh, because of what is viewed as the, the uh, relatively near-term major micro-hydro uh, uh, opportunities, so they rebalanced. But, you know, I've said uh, already here, I'm, you know, I'm happy to re-examine uh, the balance of that with, uh, with, uh, with members who are interested. I appreciate that because I, I'd like to question, you know, and say I like the old balance before, uh, some of my uh, research companies do as well. It wouldn't take much to make a really big difference for these MHK industries right in such a critical time, as you know, in their development. I encourage the department to make these investments if you can. But even with this limited funding, um, I applaud you for making such good progress. In my district alone, DOE has funded two promising ocean energy projects, a local company called Aquantis is leveraging DOE investments to develop a cutting-edge turbine to harness energy from ocean currents. And 
uh, Cal Poly University in San Luis Obispo in my district received funding to start planning a promising wave energy demonstration off, uh, project off the coast of California, Central Coast. I'm proud to say that Cal Poly is one of only two projects selected in the country. Now I want to ask you if DOE plans to uh, provide continued support for these demonstration projects to help them get up and running. It's that critical, as we, you acknowledge and I agree, that uh, what they call it the dark phase of trying to attract mm -hmm. funding from the outside when, you, uh, when it's a little bit more of a risk, but so, so much promise is, uh, is held there in this area. What are the next steps? Well, I can, I can assure you, first of all, I'll, I'll go back and, and look at those projects. I'm not uh, up to the, on the specifics, uh, and we'll get back to you in terms of how, Excellent. how, how that looks going forward. I appreciate that because right. um, I, I, I believe, as, as many of the uh, folks who've done the research in my district have demonstrated to me, uh, this holds great promise for the future, but it isn't yet to that uh, stage that solar and uh, wind are mm -hmm. now yeah. even. It's, um, it's, it's, it's longer term. That's right. And so I would encourage uh, you to explore in this direction. I thank you very much for being here. Gentlelady uh, yields back the balance for time. Uh, you, yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I do. Okay. Yes. <laughs> this time I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Lida, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. Thanks again for being with us today. And I know that uh, I think from the last time you were here, I mentioned this before, but I think it's worth mentioning again that because uh, you know we all have to look at who we represent. I represent about 60,000 manufacturing jobs in Northwest and West Central Ohio. And recently, I heard from one of the uh, my constituent companies out there, um, and it's a large manufacturer, that they uh, had uh, they're in a voluntary uh, curtailment contract with a local utility. In the years past, the agreement with the utility has amounted to some small savings for that company uh, during these uh, demands for during the peak periods. But uh, recently, the curtailments have uh, often uh, not uh, really given them any savings because they've been actually been cut back because we've had a pretty tough winter in Ohio and utilities were asked to you know, do what they could, so they asked the companies. So it's important in these cases because, the, the, again, the minor savings that they had enjoyed are gone now. And it's also important that because of that, they've lost production time, which means that folks aren't working, that people aren't bringing home a paycheck. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the employees, of course, got reduced hours. And then, of course, when you put that in, when people take their paychecks home with the increased electrical bills and more expensive health care premiums and things like that, it's pretty tough. So my, my concern and the concern of the manufacturers that I represent is that the problems today are only going to get worse as more and more of our coal power generation units are being retired as, as a result of the administration's regulations. And it's also important to note, again, in Ohio, that 78 percent of our energy in Ohio is coal-based. And in some parts of the state, and particularly in my area, it's even greater than that 78 percent. So my first question is, what will DOE do and you to ensure that this nation's manufacturers have access to reliable and affordable electricity going forward? And again, a lot of my manufacturers are ones that are out there that really need that base load capacity because they're, they run forges and everything else. So what can we expect in the future from the DOE? Well, uh, basically, I would say all of the above is is part of part of addressing the electricity system, uh, not only the electricity, but but certainly in, in that in that area. Uh, the uh, the fact is, uh, I think uh, rates on ge in general for consumers have uh, have come down with the uh, uh, natural gas revolution, and of course that has also stimulated more more manufacturing. Uh, again, we've had perhaps 125 billion dollars. Uh, invested in new manufacturing capacity directly associated with the uh, with the uh, natural gas revolution. Uh, we will continue to work on the technology side to drive costs down for all of the uh, energy sources uh, and also, as was mentioned earlier, storage uh, eventually uh, 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 to help with um, uh, variable uh, sources. Uh, and we will continue to, and, and in this budget request, uh, we will continue to have a major focus on trying to uh, develop the foundational technologies 
for our advanced manufacturing future. Well, and I agree that you know we're, we're seeing you know a, uh, a an explosion out there on the natural gas side, which is tremendous for our country. But you know, in Ohio, we're very fortunate. In the eastern side of the state, we do have the Utica Shale, and of course, in Pennsylvania, you have Marcellus. But we just can't retrofit these plants. Uh, you know, the cost of either uh, would almost be the cost of building a new plant and then the, the retrofit. So these costs are going to be passed along to these manufacturers. So, you know, don't you agree that our manufacturers out there to stay competitive across the world have to have, uh, you know, utility rates that are competitive, not just here in this country, but across the world? Well, I, I think, and I think that's what we're seeing. We're, we're, we are seeing that the, uh, the whole mentality in, internationally has changed about now the United States being a kind of a manufacturing uh, uh, center uh, increasingly, and that's a large part of that is because of our uh, our energy costs. Uh, let, me, let me ask so, this. So uh, maintaining you know, my, that, my, maintaining my time's that edge. Out, I can just ask one last question for you. If if you would see the EPA regulations out there are going to impair electri electricity reliability or raise rates, would you raise that those concerns directly to the EPA? Well, again, in the uh, we 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 obviously we we communicate, but but especially this year in our in this quadrennial energy review, it will be looking across the administration in an integrated way uh, at how we maintain and sustain and develop uh, energy infrastructure that serves the goals that you've, you've, you've stated. Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired and I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Moniz. Welcome to the committee. It is a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the National Energy Technology Lab budget is something that uh, I have a particular interest in, and that, as you may know, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, have asked the appropriators that the NETL be funded at $775.5 million for FY15, and of course the President's budget has a number that, that's much, much lower than that. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate on the Administration's vision for the NETL as it relates to uh, the President's FY15 budget request, and, and could you hypothesize about the effects of the President's proposed budget uh, on both research and jobs uh, in southwestern Pennsylvania uh, and West Virginia as it relates to the NETL? Well, in NETL, as, as, you, as you well know, and Mr. McKinley as well uh, knows, uh, uh, is our, our lead fossil energy uh, laboratory. Uh, it does have an unusual structure compared to our other laboratories in being a federal, uh, fe having federal employees as opposed to uh, contractor uh, uh, employees. Uh, uh, I certainly remain committed to, uh, in particular, to be honest, to try to build, up, continue to build up the, uh, the research and development activity in the laboratory. I think that, that we have room, room to, uh, to increase that. And as one example in our in our budget in budget submission this year, um, uh, an area where NETL certainly uh, has an interest and and, uh, and and strength is in something like methane hydrates, where we propose an increase, I think, from five to fifteen million dollars. Um, uh, you know, because this could be we don't know, but in a couple of decades, this could be the new shale gas uh, uh, going forward. So th those are the those are the things that I'll, I'll be looking at. Yeah, thank you. And since Mr. McKinney is asking questions next, I'll, I'm sure he'll follow up on uh, NETO. I'd like to move the CCS, though. Uh, uh, the Department's Carbon Capture and Storage Roadmap, which is the blueprint for DOE CCS investments, notes that the agencies developing the advanced technology platforms needed to prove that CCS can be a viable climate mitigation strategy. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to take this opportunity to hear more about the current status of DOE CCS research development and demonstration efforts, and in your view, uh, if you could tell us what role CCS technologies play in the future of coal uh, in this country and around the world, and, and also while you are addressing that, uh, we know that EPA's proposed pollution standards for new coal-fired plants that would effectively require such plants to use partial CCS. Uh, some members of this committee have asserted that CCS just isn't feasible for coal-fired plants at this time. Uh, Dr. Julio Friedman from your department testified in an ONI subcommittee uh, that first-generation CCS technologies are proven 
and commercially available for coal-fired power plants right now. A plant owner can go out and buy them today with performance. Uh, can you tell me first if you agree with that assessment and then maybe elaborate on the Department's uh, efforts with CCS? Uh, cer certainly, again, the technologies uh, are are available today. They've all been they've all been used in a, n a number of number of, uh, uh, of venues, and as, and as I said earlier, as with all of our uh, new technologies, uh, we remain focused on technology development for further cost reduction. Uh, the uh, in terms of our our program, uh, we have right now eight major uh, projects. Uh, and I would note that most of them are actually CCUS, uh, where the U is for utilization uh, of the carbon dioxide, uh, in, in this case through enhanced oil, uh, uh, oil recovery, uh, which obviously then, lo then gives you a monetary return uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the CO2. But, but uh, isn't it true that in certain parts of the country that is just not possible because correct. Yeah, the, sure. of the oil the, the, there? So that is not, and that is uh, in fact in particular. Uh, it's no accident that the of the eight major projects that we have, the two that do not have uh, utilization are in Illinois, where where that's not such a uh, attractive option. Yes. Uh, although I might say there have been many interesting discussions about uh, uh, if and when one goes to a system with lots of capture plants uh, around the country, including in the Midwest and and uh, Western Pennsylvania, et cetera, that there's a there is a lot of interest in building an infrastructure of CO2 uh, that would go down to the Gulf and then over towards the Rocky Mountains to have a major CO2 do, infrastructure. Do you think, but that is that, in the future. Do you think, though, that CCS technology uh, in areas like Western Pennsylvania where there is an oil to recover, if there isn't a recovery uh, part to help pay uh, for the cost, that it is still economically and commercially viable in those areas? Well, look, I think we are going to have to keep working to, again, to drive, drive costs down. And, and besides the demonstration projects today, which are using basically today's technology, we also have, uh, including in ARPA-E, et cetera, uh, programs to look at new technologies uh, that, uh, that can have substantially lower, lower cost. I think we are at the beginning, you know, I mean, the research, the research program for these novel, novel technologies, next generation technologies, is at a, is at a very early stage. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Uh, uh, I think that CCS is a key to the administration's all of the above strategy if we are going to have one, and I would encourage you to keep the investments going. Thank you. Yeah, we will. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being here and your forbearance today. Uh, Let us stay on the all of the above strategy concept for just a moment. I think we have a slide that shows the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy uh, in comparison to other aspects of the of your of your energy budget, um, and it's looking at the bar graph. It's it's pretty it's hard to read the writing, but uh, ERE is the is the big one, <laughs> and everything else are the small ones. So ERE just absolutely overwhelms like nuclear energy. Uh, more traditional fossil energy, more traditional sources of energy. So it seems like the Office of Nuclear Energy, fossil energy, electricity would have critical roles to play in shaping United, the future energy policy of the United States. Would, is that a fair statement? Uh, it is. Uh, um, I could comment on, on the graph, however, and note that uh, EERE, we might think as, as two programs, efficiency and, and renewables. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I wish you would. I, and I believe in energy efficiency, <laughs> right. and sometimes coupling it with renewable energy, right. is, in fact, distracts us from the the validity and and the importance of energy efficiency. No one of either political party is going to run on a platform of wasting energy. Mm -hmm. So energy efficiency is is one of the things that I should think we should put high on our list. So, in fact, in, for future graphs, I would appreciate the ability to tease out what is renewable energy and what are the gains that we can have from expanded energy efficiency. You were and starting uh, to answer it. I'll, I'll let you finish. Uh, and I might just, you know, I'm just add, and in the, in the budget request for FY15, in fact, energy efficiency is actually the largest of the proposed increases. Let's... Um, And will you be able to? Pro can can you provide us those those figures? Sure. Okay, yeah. thank you. And I, I, I we don't need to go into it now. But if you if you could make that available, I think that would be helpful. And I've got a, a series of questions that might, in fact, then not be necessary. Looking at those uh, at those numbers, 
I've got some questions that the home builders back home are are really concerned. Um, you've got energy building codes that were developed by Department of Energy and authorized to serve as, tech, as the technical advisor during the development of the codes. Your role has expanded over time and now uh, it's almost moved into the point of advocacy. The Department of Energy representatives even pursue what is a very aggressive energy goals that actually increase the cost of housing by by having to meet these requirements. Is that something that uh, that you're willing to take a look at? I'm sure, I'm sure uh, yes, I'm not familiar with that. I'll look at it. I uh, can provide you information that has been provided to me by, would be by home builders in, in North Texas, but apparently it's been, the, the, the requirements have been out there for some time. The world has changed around them, but the net effect is we're spending a lot of money to meet those requirements on technologies that aren't adding that much to energy efficiency, uh, but really do drive the cost of construction when other things might be a more reasonable expenditure. So I will make that information available to your office, Thank and you. I would appreciate your, your response on that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that, I'm going to yield back. The gentleman yields back. This time, I recognize the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Dr. Christensen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Secretary. We're really excited to have you here to discuss the 2015 budget for the Department of Energy. In order to meet the President's clean energy targets by 2020, we must continue to support the development and deployment of new innovative clean energy technologies, but we also must encourage initiatives that support families to make any change that they can at the household level to make to um, increase efficiency. So I'm pleased to see that the weatherization assistance program has been designated a 31 percent increase in funding, and I hope this continues to be a priority item as it serves critical needs in my district where residential ratepayers are charged over 51 cents per kilowatt and commercial over 55 cents, and I know you've heard me say that before. The weatherization program allows our local energy office to assist low-income families to reduce their energy costs by providing new efficient refrigerators, solar water heaters, air conditioning, different bulbs, and similar improvements, which may seem small for some, but go a long way in our small and tight-knit community. It's also a great benefit to the local vendors that provide the products and service for the program. The state energy program is another key program that we really depend on a lot to provide energy programs for the general public and we want to thank I want to thank you for your support of these two important programs. I want to go back to climate change for a minute and w uh, much has been said about the intergovernmental panel on ch climate change and their new report that was reported earlier this week that described the Im impact of climate change on our natural environment but also warns about the impacts on human health and safety. The scientists identified several key risks. One is, quote, risk of death, injury, ill health, or disrupted livelihoods in low-lying coastal zones in small island developing states like mine and other small islands due to storm surges, surges coastal flooding, and sea level rise. When I was here earlier, you talked about the threats to utilities and water supplies. Uh, Mr. Secretary, would you agree that the potential impacts of climate change pose a human health and safety risk to people who live along coastal areas or islands as well? Uh, certainly, and, and islands, of course, are, are uh, often quite, quite exposed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, periods of extreme heat pose public health risk too. How worried should we be that heat waves resulting from about the heat waves um, resulting from unchecked climate change? Well, again, I think what we see is, are, are more extremes, both hot and cold. <laughs> we also had the polar vortex, in fact, recently. Yes. And um, the IPCC report also warns that ext extreme weather events, as you said, will become more frequent as, as the climate warms, will damage infrastructure and critical services. Um, given all of these potential impacts, would you characterize climate change as also a critical public health challenge, as not only an environmental challenge? Yes, it's an it's environment, economy, health, and security challenge. A lot of times when we talk about, you know, moving to a, a greener economy and renewable fuels, the talk is about the cost and jobs and, and uh, ec economic damage, but we never take into account the public health cost. Um, and so I just wanted to focus on public health in my mm -hmm. questioning. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for being here. 
gentlelady yields back. This time, recognize the gentleman from uh, Louisiana, Dr. Cassidy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, uh, Mr. Munez, how are you? Hello. Um, listen, I, I'm following up something that uh, Mr. Hall asked earlier regarding the uh, uh, the offshore deep water port facilities for liquefied natural gas. Now, I, as I'm told, I was in another meeting. I was told that you had mentioned kind of a lack of familiarity with it, but you had looked into it. Now, my concern is is that I have here a letter dated October the 18th, 2013, from Mr. Jonathan Levy, Deputy Chief of Staff of the uh, Office of the Secretary of the DOE, and he is requesting that the that that um, there would be a a parallel process to review these. Um, uh, offshore LNG terminals as opposed to the FERC terminals. Now, since we're looking to see how we can expedite the approval of these processes, and I gather in the FERC process, whichever comes off next is the one that you review next, clearly we have uh, something which is outside FERC, it's a parallel agency, and this seems something that, uh, again, the Secretary suggested that you all had set up the parallel process. So with that introduction, it's kind of troubling to me that you would not be familiar with it. It tells me if the letter came October 18th, and it refers actually to another letter from 2012, that this would not be a priority for your agency. And if it's not a priority, it's probably not going to happen. Um, can you reassure me regarding my concerns? As, as I said uh, uh, to Mr. Hall, I think I, I, I will sh certainly go back and look at this whole issue of the MARAD, uh, the MARAD approvals uh, in, the, uh, in the queue. Yeah, if you could, because frankly, it seems like a parallel process is indicated particularly if we're trying to make export of LNG a priority. And again, my concern, the fact that it's kind of an unknown issue suggests that it's not a priority. Those are jobs in my state. No, I, I'm, to, to be clarify, I mean, I, I'm, certainly, I'm certainly aware of the issue of, of the MARAD, uh, the MARAD uh, approvals in lieu of FERC approvals for that. Uh, I'm just, uh, I just have to go back and, and look at where we stand in that, in that discussion. Okay. I, 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 don't give, I don't want to give misinformation. Okay, thank you. Let me change gears to um, uh, mixed oxide fuel fabrication. That's that plant uh, on the, uh, in South Carolina. I gather that the Department of Energy is seeking to put in, I would call it mothball. I think it's called cold standby. Now, it's my understanding that this was not supposed to be done because Congress has indicated that this process should be created, that we're now 60 percent through with the process and it's going to cost a certain amount of money to put it in cold standby that actually could be used for the completion of the project. So if, but again, I gather that it's being shut down, if you will, because if you're concerned about the cost. Uh, can you give us that cost analysis to put the facility into the cold shutdown? How much will it cost to do so? The, the, oh, well, first of all, there are several analyses about the large life cycle cost, which are frankly all converging to this $30 billion or so. Now, I'm told there's a GAO, I'm sorry, I don't, limited time, I'm sorry. I'm told there's a GAO report that pegs it at $24 billion. Yeah, so the GAO said $24 billion, but it acknowledged that it had left things out and, and suggested it was likely to be higher. And so I think I would put them and the DOE analysis and the Army Corps of Engineer analysis of the facility are all consistent in now, terms I'm of... I'm told that that Army Corps analysis is not yet public. Or, or, uh, is, is that going to be made public? Um, I, I anticipate it will be, yes. Uh, it, it, it was not full life cycle. That was for the capital facility. Uh -huh. But on that part, it was in line, in fact, a little bit higher than, than our, uh, our, our estimate. So, again, the approach was that uh, $30 billion life cycle looks like pretty hard to sustain, so we felt that in the FY15 budget we proposed roughly $220 million uh, for options analysis to make sure, in, fact, in the end, the administration and the Congress have got to, we have to come together to decide, you know, but how are we going to dispose of this plutonium? Is a $30 billion project the way to go? So is the there a I'm the almost standby. out of time. So, so if there's an alternative, has the alternative been identified? And if so, what would be the life cycle cost of the alternative? There, there, uh, there was a National Academy report in the, in, the, in, uh, in the 1990s that identified 31 alternatives. We've restricted that to four or five. Uh, some are reactor alternatives. Some are non-reactor alternatives. Our initial look 
suggest that some of the others are as expensive, but some may not be. So that's what we need to, to work up and come to the Congress uh, uh, with ter in terms of the path forward. We want to make sure that in the standby, uh, nothing is irreversible because MOX remains an option uh, in, the, uh, in, in the suite. Okay, I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you. This time, Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the Chair, and welcome back, Secretary Moniz. Thank you. My question today will focus on the nuclear power workforce, grid challenges during disasters, and for a change, LNG exports. <laughs> First, the energy nuclear power workforce. The South Texas project in Bay City, Texas, is key to the Gulf Coast grid. It provides reliable, affordable power to the entire Houston area. Been doing that since 1988. However, STP is dealing with a, an, an aging workforce. Workers are retiring and there aren't enough qualified replacements. Now, Warren County Junior College is stepping up to the challenge. Led by the great president, Betty McCrowan, Warren has opened a fourth campus in Bay City. And with the help of the Matagorda County judge, Nate McDonald, they're offering two-year degrees, associate degrees, in three nuclear power specialties. I'd love to have you come down and see that facility sometime if you're going by the South Texas plant. But nationally, uh, nuclear power workers in STEM aren't as exciting as four-year liberal arts degrees. And that concerns me. I'm proud. I graduated from Rice University and from UT Law School. But lawyers like me who've never practiced law and liberal arts majors are great with pens and paper, but terrible with fixing combined cycle gas turbines. And so my question is, what do you see when you look at our energy workforce? Is there anything DOE can do in its budget relating to finding the next generation of scientists, engineers, or high-tech construction workers? Well, we, uh, I think you know, we do have um, somewhat limited authorities in terms of uh, you know, direct educational programs, uh, but uh, I think this issue of workforce uh, in, um, in a number of areas of, relevant, of relevance to the department's emissions uh, uh, is, is a major challenge. By the way, we have the same issue in some of our laboratories uh, in terms of the, the nuclear, nuclear workforce. Uh, so we would like to work to find ways uh, to focus on, on core disciplines, core areas of relevance to the energy space where we might look at, at in, in, increasing things like internship programs, traineeship programs, that kind of activity. Because I, I agree, in fact, Mr. Rush mentioned earlier in terms of the minorities uh, in, in energy. It's, in, it's we're not, we need, we need more people coming into the workforce and that's only going to be helped if we uh, work across the entire spectrum, gender, race, yep. uh, et cetera. So I'd love to work, I'd love, be, we'd be happy to work with you. And I yourself uh, or somebody? I will send Pete Lyons up to see there you. There you go, that's it. Send him down there, <laughs> uh, basically yeah. Texas. Great. My second question is about grid, reco grid recovery and disaster. The 2014 hurricane season starts June 1st. My hometown of Houston, the whole area, is in Hurricane Alley. As we've seen, the grid can be very vulnerable in severe weather. Keeping the lights and air conditioning on should be a top priority for all of us. When Hurricane Ike hit in 2008, two million people lost their power. Dewey's budget has some priorities I think are interesting. You want to spend five times the amount on wind energy, 115 million, then on energy infrastructure security and restoration, 22.6 million. Texans love wind. We're the number one producer of wind in America. But we also remember America's most disastrous hurricane, the Galveston hurricane of 1900, when over 6,000 people minimum were killed. Should I be concerned about DOE's priorities here? Well, I think, uh, frankly, we're, we're trying to uh, ramp up uh, our uh, emergency response capability um, and also our, what you might call, pr 
prevention possibility through looking at infrastructure to make our infrastructure more resilient so that if something does happen, it doesn't go down, or if it goes down, it comes back faster. So that's a big focus uh, uh, of us, uh, for us. Um, uh, we, again, we, we have some specific proposals in the FY15 budget uh, to, to amplify these uh, capacities. Uh, one is to uh, have a dedicated energy infrastructure response center. Uh, it's, a, I forget, it's six or eight million dollars proposal to outfit a place where we can look at the country's infrastructure and help, and help us in, in directing federal assets to, uh, to, to assist with, uh, with, with recovery. We also propose to place one, um, one person uh, in each of the FEMA districts to understand this, this, the region-specific issues with regard, to, with regard to risks. And we feel that, you know, that, that having a person embedded in that way, you really understand the, the, local, the local situation uh, and you can understand who to call quickly uh, when there are problems. You can do training, uh, all kinds of things. So those are two specific initiatives uh, on emergency response. But in addition, in the Quadrennial Energy Review, uh, there's basically going to be two major focuses. One is elect electricity system, and the other one is the fuels infrastructure. And on the latter, for sure, we are going to do region by region analyses of, the, of resilient fuels infrastructure, because we've seen different problems in all different parts of the country. Just recently, the propane, for example, in the, uh, especially in the upper Midwest, although it went to other parts of the country as well. So we, we really are building in this area. We think it's a high priority. Come see Warren Kind Jew in college, my friend. I yield back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you again, uh, Mr. Secretary, for appearing before us. Um, I want to build off a little bit of what uh, Mr. Would the Green gentleman uh, move the microphone up? Yeah, thank you. To hold it, I guess. Um, the, uh, I want to build off what Doyle and, and uh, Green both talked about with Nettle uh, and also your, your uh, CCS. Um, the uh, back, so the back, backdrop of my question is going to have to do with that. Uh, there, are, there are folks that uh, will contend, and maybe justifiably, that some of climate change involves uh, CO2 emissions. Um, not going to disagree there is climate change. The question, I think, is how much is man-made? You with me on? Yeah, I'm trying. Uh, yeah, if we could have. How much of it is man-made? Um, so I, I just, just looking at a, at a chart that, that we've put together, yeah, because the variable is the amount produced by man. And in this chart, you see that the, almost 70 percent comes from fossil fuels uh, of the energy produced. Now, the second chart shows that the second chart shows that very little is being spent in research in fossil fuels. And if that indeed is the problem, if fossil fuels is the problem, I don't understand why there's a disconnect between that and the research with that. Uh, because you can look at it, the, uh, uh, the research dollar is only around 18 percent. Um, but more specifically, for Nettle, the fossil energy research has been cut by over 15 percent. And, and importantly, the comment that was raised over there, the carbon capture, one of the keys to the future of using fossil fuels and under some of the regulations that are being issued by the EPA, they've cut the, cut the research money in, in carbon capture by 16 percent. They've cut the, on carbon storage by 26 percent. Uh, if, if we're serious about trying to include fossil fuels in our energy matrix, I, I, I think someone's being disingenuous uh, about their interest in uh, all of the above, and, and rather that there, there, is, there truly is this war on coal. So is, is this, are we, is, do you think the President is deliberately trying to discredit or diminish the use of coal in, in America? Uh, again, in terms of the uh, in terms of the R and D uh, numbers, for example, uh, again, I, I, I respectfully feel that this does not give the full picture. I mean, the this administration 
uh, is unprecedented in its in its uh, its investments in coal, in the CCS in particular, CCUS, uh, with six then billion dollars. Why, why do we see cuts of forty and forty some but, percent? But six six That's billion dollars in CCUS, and right now uh, an what? active uh, uh, loan program solicitation of eight billion dollars for fossil fuels generally. I can't get into the uh, specifics of some of the initial proposals. It's a rolling, there will be more proposals. Mr. Secretary, but there, there, are, there is coal. If in you can there. appreciate, we have that five minute drill. We have, to, we have limited ability to ask enough questions here. But the, uh, um, my focus again is over nettle, is providing increased research dollars into nettle. Um, and I think it sends a message uh, to the laboratories, both in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, that we're serious about them. Uh, whether that's a chemical loop, whether it, whether that's a fracking techniques, and all the things that have been developed at Nettle, uh, that they'll continue, that they can count on it, that their employment is secure. Uh, I think it also sends a message if we put the proper amount of money in Nettle, we're sending a strong message to the coal miners all across America in the coal fields that their jobs are secure, that there is a future for coal mining, and 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 it just eliminates the uncertainty. I, I'm I, I use that backdrop as for nettle, but, but also if we continue this attack on coal um, and fossil fuels and not put the money into the research, if we decarbonize America, do you really think the health of the world will improve that much if America alone by itself were to not burn fossil fuels? Do you think the health of the world would be better? Well, for, first, let me say, I, I will go back and look at the nettle program specifically. Number two, I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, things like methane hydrates, uh, I think we sure. tripled, uh, which will be in a nettle interest. Third, on the last question, uh, we all recognize that obviously the United States alone uh, uh, cannot uh, change the uh, trajectory, but what we do is very, very important, uh, and, and I think uh, and the President when, feels the that other, other nations, he will show uh, leadership here. But, Mr. Secretary, the other nations aren't following us. Uh, uh, Germany is building more coal-fired powerhouses. So my, my message is until we get a global uh, unanimous effort to try to do this, why do we continue to attack our coal industry and, and diminish it and cause uncertainty with it? Uh, I, 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 I'm past my time. I'm sorry. And Again, I would just say that we're, we're making unprecedented investments in coal, uh, huge in scale. Gentlemen's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, for five minutes. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I, I just want to first say that overall, <clears throat> I am uh, satisfied with the President's FY 2015 budget for the Department of Energy. Um, at a time of uh, significant alarm over climate change, I'm encouraged that the budget request offers a 2.6 increase above FY 2014, and I'm particularly interested in the budgeting for alternative transportation fuels. I want to commend you and the President for proposing a $2 billion set aside for an energy security trust, as well as other investments in alternative fuels and energy efficiency. Uh, for many years, I have uh, introduced the Open Fuel Standard Act uh, just recently with my colleague from Florida, Eliana Ross Layton. And I've done this for the past several years with bipartisan support uh, from this committee. And I do believe that this legislation will uh, drive, uh, help drive domestic production of all types of alternative fuels while while decreasing our reliance on foreign oil from hostile regimes. And it's also been the goal of my Oil and National Security Caucus, which is focused on ways to reduce our dependence on foreign oil while making the U.S. energy independent. So, Mr. Secretary, in the, in the past you have mentioned electric vehicles. Can you expand on what other types of alternative fuels you foresee being developed and funded through the Energy Security Trust? Well, I, I think the, uh, uh, first of all, with regard to, to vehicles, let's say, writ broadly, uh, I think there are three major thrusts uh, on what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. One is efficiency of vehicles. Second is alternative fuels. The open fuel standard would be, would be fit, fit, fit in there, of course. Uh, and, and third, electrification. And, and we think they're all, uh, all important directions and, in fact, can, can work uh, uh, can work together. So um, uh, on the uh, on the electric vehicles, if you want to focus on that uh, first, uh, we of course are continuing the, the the battery research. 
uh, but issues such as, uh, such as light weighting uh, have very, very important implications for uh, electric vehicles because of, the, because of ra range issues, et cetera. So we're, we're pushing on that. And, uh, and yesterday, uh, uh, we had a discussion with the uh, auto suppliers uh, of, of the United States uh, in terms of uh, the advanced vehicle, uh, uh, advanced technology vehicle program uh, at, uh, at, uh, at DOE. Uh, and uh, there noted that much of the, uh, almost any plug-in hybrid sold uh, in the, in any, anywhere has some DOE-driven DOE technology in it. Uh, and this provides new opportunities uh, for, uh, for our suppliers. Thank you. Um, I want to just make uh, a couple of statements about some, some things uh, pertaining to New York. And, and if you can submit it to me because we only have five minutes. I know there's not time. But obviously about Hur Hurricane Sandy is something that we're still feeling the, the, the pangs of in the Northeast. Um, during that hurricane um, or superstorm, significant fuel supply shortages and New York City area were caused by damage to supply train components in New Jersey, and the city and state have no, regu uh, have no authority, regulatory authority to intervene, and it's caused problems. I'm told New York City <coughs> requested the DOE and the National Petroleum Council uh, to convene a regional working group to develop a strategy for securing physical infrastructure like pipelines, refineries, and terminals. So I'm wondering if you could submit to me, you don't have to do it now. Uh, an update on the status of the working group and its findings. And I'd also like to ask you uh, to um, have, have the agency follow up with my office in the city to discuss the findings and to address some of the jurisdictional concerns that took place after the, uh, after the storm. Certainly. Uh, I, I charged the, new, the National Petroleum Council last October to do this fuel uh, resiliency uh, studies. And it, it, it will involve as well these issues of authorities and seams and gaps in authorities. So that's very important. And we'll get back to you, to your office. Thank you. And, and finally, I, I just want to um, mention uh, the whole issue uh, of, of fracking and um, um, with the difficulties we're having with, with Russia uh, bullying uh, all the neighboring countries, whether the United States should, um, should export uh, natural gas uh, and, uh, and and other such things. Um, can you address what uh, steps DOE is taking to deal with environmental concerns that are a result of, of fracking, uh, such as methane leaks and groundwater contamination? Um, it, people in my district get very uh, um, nervous about it. Uh, I've spoken with the uh, um, with with the, the the people that do this, and they. You know, assure me. I've been to uh, to Alberta. I've been to North Dakota, and they assure us that there's no no damage of any contamination. C can you can you tell us uh, what's what what your observations are? Uh, well, we've been I think consistently uh, stating that the 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 environmental the footprint issues of of production uh, uh, they're challenging, but they're manageable. Uh, the issue is you have to manage them. Uh, and, uh, and we still think there are ways to go. For example, our Secretary of Energy Advisory Board uh, just last Friday, I think it was, uh, finalized a report on, called Frac Focus, uh, looking at the, at the issues of disclosures of chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. And while you know, it gave uh, some credit uh, for, for progress, it also pointed out many areas of possible improvement. So what we're doing is, whether it's research or it's on issues like this, where we're trying to push for continuous improvement, best practices is absolutely critical uh, in, in, all, in all cases. Uh, so, uh, so obviously, the, this has been a big boon to our economy, uh, uh, will continue to be one, but we need to keep working on, on, the, on the footprint. And the methane, and the last, and we have an inter interagency methane strategy, uh, where again we will have a lot of responsibilities, not only in production, but in things like mid and downstream uh, 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 gas transportation. The gentleman's Thank time is expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinsinger, for five Thank minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here, and thanks for serving your country. Um, in 2010, the National Insulation Association, in conjunction with the Department of Energy estimated that the simple maintenance of mechanical insulation in industrial and manufacturing plants could deliver $3.7 in energy savings every year. 
Uh, in today's budget climate, would you agree that it makes sense to pursue cost-saving measures such as the increased use and maintenance of mechanical insulation in federal buildings and facilities to help save hardworking taxpayer dollars and overall energy consumption? Absolutely. Efficiency of buildings is a major opportunity. Has your agency, through its federal uh, energy management program or any other program, ever evaluated the potential energy savings available to federal agencies through the greater utilization or upgrading of mechanical insulation in federal facilities? I don't know the answer to that question, but I will, I will find it. Okay. Well, would you commit to back, evaluating back to the potential source? Yes. There, the ener energy savings? Mr. Secretary, as we've seen in this committee and others, Russia has been energy it, uh, wielding its energy prowess on the world stage for some time now. Uh, not only do they supply the majority of natural gas to our European allies, but they're also exporting their nuclear technology at a rapid pace. In fact, I was recently in Hungary, and they signed a, another agreement with the Russians in terms of nuclear production. In fact, Russia has either built or is in the process of building 36 reactors around the world. Last time we had a chance to talk on this subcommittee, I expressed my concerns that a vacuum of U.S. nuclear energy exports would occur in the very near future if your agency did not set out clear and concise guidelines to push forward an effective nuclear energy policy. I believe the U.S. should be the leader in the realm of nuclear expertise, but Russia's influence in nuclear energy exports and therefore their, geo, their uh, geopolitical influence seems to be expanding beyond ours. What are you doing and, and your agency doing to reestablish our competitiveness in this area? Well, it's a whole variety of things. Uh, one, one is uh, we did uh, provide a loan guarantee for the new AP-1000 construction uh, reactors in, in, in uh, Georgia. We're pursuing, of course, uh, uh, R&D. But in addition to that, I might say in a very different, uh, different vein, uh, we, we do do, um, when, when sanctioned uh, by the government, we, we have been very active in promoting uh, U.S. technology abroad. Um, uh, including quite quite recently, uh, the uh, I think there's a lot of promise for uh, both Westinghouse and GE technologies right now uh, ab abroad. Uh, the fact that we are building in this country makes a huge difference uh, in terms of being able to promote the technology. China is building a whole bunch of Westinghouse uh, uh, reactors, but just as one comment. Russia, you mentioned Russia, and just note that in some cases they do they do something that we can't can't right. do, which is essentially provide the financing and make it a turnkey yeah, operation. And, and I appreciate that, and I think that's a conversation as a Congress we have to have, and and with the administration in terms of that, because obviously the Russians are providing this financial support for a reason, for a geopolitical advantage. So when we don't do things like that, or we're not competitive in this arena, I think it affects us geopolitically. As the chairman noted earlier, and it was mentioned earlier, I also have concerns with your decision to stop the construction of the MOX plant in South Carolina. Beyond the concerns I have with the decision to let taxpayer money sit in dormant on a project that's nearly 60 percent complete, uh, I have concerns with the impact that this will have in the realm of non-proliferation with Russia. I've seen comments from a former Russian official who said that the decision to stop construction of this plant is a breach of the U.S.-Russian agreement on this issue and that Russia may decide to go their own way since the U.S. is not following through with its end of the deal. Do you, did you consider the ramifications when you made this decision? If so, why? If not, why? And uh, if so, do you believe this is still the correct path forward? Uh, first of all, those, uh, those, uh, those issues were very much part of the, of the discussion. And I do want to emphasize, we have not canceled the MOX project. Uh, the Russians the think we have, so... Well, um, I would just say discussions with Russia have changed in character over the last uh, uh, couple of months. Uh, so I did discuss this uh, with uh, Mr. Kirienko, uh, head of Rosatom, uh, twice uh, in the last year as I saw the cost going up, just, just saying, look, this is just a heads up kind of thing. We'll, we, we, I don't know where we're going uh, with that yet. But what I want to emphasize is that, uh, as I said earlier, uh, I, I think the the life cycle cost estimates are pretty much converging to this kind of $30 billion number, okay. and it's a big number, and I think it's a collective decision about uh, what, what we can do. Thank you. And I'll just end with this. Over the past decade, the EU has pursued a broad range of climate policies, including renewable energy subsidies for wind and solar power. Those climate policies have led to high energy costs in Europe. In fact, they had some interesting conversation with some CEOs of European companies. And they're threatening the competitiveness of many of, of Europe's energy intensive industries. I just want to say in closing, I hope that raises red flags with you and you uh, take a look at kind of the European experience versus ours and, and act accordingly. Thank you for your time and being here, and I yield back.
Thank you. Gentleman uh, yields back. This time, recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the Energy Policy Act of 2005 authorized the Clean Coal Technology Program and certain tax credits to assist development of the next generation clean coal technology, including carbon capture and sequestration. My understanding of what your discussion was earlier uh, this morning with uh, Congressman Doyle was that the DOE believes these projects on carbon capture and sequestration that are currently ongoing reflect technology that is already in or demonstrated as viable for commercial service in, in coal power plants. Is that, am I correct in my understanding of your previous testimony? Yes, they, they are mainly using solvent technologies that have, that have been used before. So here's the catch-22. I'm not sure I agree with you because also, as Congressman Doyle pointed out, unless you happen to be like the Mississippi facility right down the road from the oil uh, well where you're going to use the carbon to uh, push up the oil, that they may not be commercially viable. But the catch-22 is, is that if that is accurate, the statute uh, makes it clear that you're not supposed to be giving them money anymore. If they're commercially viable now, they don't need the support from the tax credits. But you're still giving them the tax credits, are you not? The issue is that this is a, this is a, uh, a system integration issue um, uh, uh, pursuing a new, a new deployment uh, of, the, of, of the whole system. Uh, so so it, is, it, is, it is, I, I would say, uh, quite, uh, quite eligible. Well, I mean, the problem is it says that this technology has to be well beyond the level that are in commercial service or have been demonstrated as viable for commercial service. So you're in a catch-22 because if they are, in fact, viable for commercial service, as both you and the EPA submit, mm -hmm. I happen to disagree, they're not eligible for the money. If they are commercially viable, they're not eligible for the money. And so I would submit that you all need to figure that one out, either cut the money off or and, and say that they are commercially viable or admit that they aren't commercially viable. And I don't know that there's an answer necessary well, for that, but that's, that's the dilemma that we have is that if you're following the code, which I always think is the right thing to do, that's why we have a Congress, that's why we agreed. pass laws, that's <laughs> why we have a Senate and a House that pass them and a President signs them, mm. is because we actually mean for people to follow them. Mm. If we follow the law, you can't have it both ways. You can't say they're commercially viable, therefore these new regs come into effect, or they aren't commercially viable, therefore they're eligible for the tax credits. I submit they're eligible for the tax credits, but that the EPA has got the cart before the horse and that you need to probably call their hand on it. That being said, let me move on because okay. you can't respond, and I appreciate that, and I understand that. I'm not, not offended by that. The EIA uh, has reported in February that the number of coal-fired power plant retirements will be higher than originally anticipated and that an estimated 60 gigawatts of coal-fired capacity will retire by 2020. Notably, EIA has, expects 90 percent of the coal-fired capacity retirements to occur by 2016. Now, this means nearly 18 percent of all coal-fired generation in the United States will retire in the next two years due to new regulations. Are you concerned, is the DOE concerned that the loss of these critical generation facilities in such a short time frame will make it increasingly difficult to meet electricity demands as we move forward, putting reliability at risk? Uh, first, I would just comment that I think you know the, the market forces with gas cannot cannot also be dismissed in terms of uh, what's happening with with coal. But analyses that I have seen suge suggest that that reliability can uh, will certainly be preserved if this is if this is what happens over these next years. Well, and my concern is is that I recognize that at some point, because of the regulations, gas is going to uh, surpass uh, coal. Uh, I may not like that, but that's where we're headed. And I also recognize that someday coal, uh, the gas may be able to take up that slack. What I'm concerned about is between today and that time period. I'm concerned that next year mm -hmm. or in the winter of 2016 that we will see some real problems with this many coal plants uh, being reduced. And, and I think that DOE ought to be concerned about as, that as well. Also, with all that new expenditure, closing down facilities, in fact, there are two different facilities, three different uh, uh, generators, but two facilities in my district alone that will be closing down. One of the ones that will close down, which is a third one I didn't, or a fourth one, depending on how you count them, that I didn't mention, is converting to natural gas. But with all those expenditures having to be made by the power companies, it is uh, reasonably expe expected that costs will go up as the power companies recoup their expenditures. Isn't that true? 
I assume that I don't I don't know the details of the rate case, but I assume that that, that would be the case. Mm -hmm. And and let me make an assumption, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong. I would assume that you all are are talking with EPA about any concerns related to reliability between the present and whenever natural gas can pick up the slack. But if we're going to lose 18 percent over the next two years, that's a pretty significant uh, and, and, cliff mm -hmm. for the power companies to adjust to, is it not? And, and with FERC. And with FERC, sure. Mm -hmm. But that's a big, that's a steep cliff, is it not? 18 percent of coal being gone when it's about well, 40 percent. Well, 60 gigawatts uh, if to 2020 would be a substantial, uh, substantial amount. Uh, but again, analyses that have been done suggest that 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 reliability will will be preserved. That I that's also at the, at the ISO level a lot. Uh, those those calculations. I hope you're right. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to uh, you, Mr. Secretary, and I join my colleagues in thanking you for your service as well. Uh, just a couple of questions for you. In May of last year, President Obama was quoted as saying he has to make an executive decision broadly about whether or not we export liquefied natural gas at all. What discussions have you had with President Obama regarding the issue of LNG exports? Well, and uh, we've we've discussed uh, discussed this, including recently, obviously, in the context of the situation in Europe at the moment. Uh, and at this stage, we are we are carrying through with the the, the process and the strategy uh, as uh, uh, as been, has it been practiced. And again, as I noted earlier, uh, uh, one one should not uh, uh, dismiss the scale of what has already been at least conditionally approved prior to the FERC approval because the 9.3 BCF per day is already essentially equal to the exports of gutter, the world's largest LNG exporter. But uh, has the crisis involving Russia and the Ukraine influenced your decision making or your time frame at all with respect to LNG exports? Uh, a major issue there is uh, if you look at our last order, uh, the Jordan Cove uh, order of uh, last week, I think it was, uh, uh, or the week before, the, uh, there's, a, there's a discussion, this discussion of uh, the international markets and, and putting LNG in, in, into, into international markets. But the, the major thing right now is we're going to have, uh, as was announced, uh, well, was really, really announced last week, and discussed again in Brussels yesterday, we're going to have under the G7 umbrella an energy minister's process uh, uh, that was going to look at our collective energy security. So we're, we're exporting our energy security to other nations to make that decision? No, 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 no. Quite the contrary. Uh, obviously, so the G7 uh, will make decisions on whether or not we uh, export LNG we exports. Are, we are going to have a no. We are going to have a meeting to discuss our collective interest in energy security. Now, obviously, the risk. So we're waiting for the G7 to get back to us on whether or not we expedite LNG permitting. Uh, look, obviously, we are we are we are, we are uh, evaluating this. Uh, well, is, is, so are we the, waiting the, for the process? G7's the process we're talking about. There was a meeting already yesterday. And of the G7. No, there was a meeting yesterday of the ESEU. Secretary Kerry and Deputy Secretary Poneman were there. From, that's from, from energy, uh, uh, that is Poneman. Uh, and uh, we will very soon be having a G7 process. Let, let, me, just, uh, let me just ask this, because I, I have a number of other questions, uh, including whether or not you've taken the time to look at H.R. 6 in the House and whether or not you support the, the legislation, making it easier to export. But I want to make this clear. So we are asking the G7 whether or not it's in the world's interest to export LNG from the United States? No, I did not say that. We are having, we will be having a discussion around the whole issues, the set of issues of energy security, what it means for us, what it means for them. And, and permitting it is, it is not decisions an coming it out is of that? It is not an LNG export uh, caucus. Well, let me just ask you this then. Are you basing determinations on LNG exports in part on those discussions with G7 nations? Uh, I would use that as, as an input go, going forward, uh, of course. So is it the President's, is it the Administration's opinion that we will wait for G7 discussions before no, we I, approve I did for not the DOE that. permits? No. Well, I, I'd like to know more about this because I think it is alarming that we would wait for G7 nations uh, for approval Which is uh, why to I did export not say, LNG. I did not say we would uh, wait. You just said that part of your determinations would be made on discussions As we go G7. down the road, we, uh, this, is go, this is a long process. Uh, to, and, to approve the permits is a long process? Well, look, we have a public interest determination Should we or should we law. not expedite LNG permitting in this country? We have been working expeditiously 
on a case-by-case -case basis based upon substantial we do it faster than and we already making, are. And making a public interest determination that we are required to make by law. If the law changes, we will follow the law. Will the public interest determination weigh in part on the G7 discussions? Um, not directly. That's, that's our responsibility. But indirectly, the G7 discussions will weigh on a U.S. public interest determination? Geopolitical issues have always been on the list of issues to address in the public, uh, public interest determination. They are there. Now, obviously, discussing with our friends and allies energy security issues is part of a geopolitical consideration, is there which is balanced against things like domestic market considerations. Is there anything in the law right now preventing DOE from, uh, from a decision to approve all pending permits? We, uh, first of all, we cannot give approval until, uh, at a minimum, the NEPA process is completed, which is, which is at FERC. DOE is waiting on FERC first before you make a decision? That's not what you mean. Yes. The current, the current approach is that we give a conditional, just to clarify, we have issued s one final and six conditional approvals. There's only one final approval. That's the Sabine Pass uh, project in, uh, in uh, Louisiana. Uh, and they will start exporting in 2015. The additional six, and I've approved five of those, uh, are conditional, conditional. Conditional. Conditional approvals. They must also get NEPA process approval through FERC, although earlier... But DOE, for your side, you don't wait for FERC to make their determination for your side to approve. We, You're saying no, that okay. we have to wait. Yes, we, yeah. by law, by law. We, right. we 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 must have the environmental, the NEPA right. approval. And just to clarify, because two other members mentioned this earlier, uh, the one distinction is that there are now some applicants for deep water LNG, so that would not be FERC, but there would be an analogous MARAD determination that we would need to have on the environmental side. I'm running out of time here. In fact, I think I've run out of time. But another question, H.R. 6, the bill that we've introduced in the House, would provide expedited approval to World Trade Organization member nations. Would this bill make your job easier and reduce the time required to wait for DOE and indeed improve our geopolitical I think, I think security the choice, the world? I think the choice is to Congress whether it wants to or not, will not want to emphasize the public interest determination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Time's expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Secretary, good to see you again. See you. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to ask a few questions about the American Centrifuge Program in Piketon, Ohio, which uh, I think you know is a couple of frog jumps away from, uh, from my district border, uh, just across the county line. I first want to ask you, and I think I know the answer to this because I, I asked you this the last time you were with us, uh, do you still believe the U.S., uh, the United States needs a domestic enrichment capacity for national security purposes? We, we need, an, uh, for national security purposes, we need an American technology capacity for enrichment. Okay. Uh, I think so, too. Over the, over the last two years, the Department has invested $280 million to build, install, and test the centrifuge machines needed to address this very critical national security purpose. Your department actually owns the centrifuge machines and the support equipment, uh, and testing over the past year has demonstrated its technical readiness. I understand that yesterday when you testified before Energy and Water uh, Development Subcommittee, you indicated that the department was looking to use the transfer authority uh, provided in the, in the omnibus to fund the continued activities after the RD&D program concludes on April 15th. Correct. This would avoid uh, the major disruptions from job losses, industrial demobilization and operational stoppage, and will likely save the taxpayers money in the long run. Uh, I want to commend you for that, uh, for pursuing this course of action. I do have a couple of questions, though, about the timing. First, the language in the omnibus states that before the department can transfer uh, the $56.65 million, DOE must first submit a cost-benefit report on all of the options for securing the low enriched uranium fuel needed for national security purposes and your preference. And most importantly, that report must cite uh, or must sit with the two relevant appropriation subcommittees for 30 days 
and receive their approval before you can initiate the transfer. So uh, the clock must run for at least 30 days, but the current funding uh, for the enrichment activities expires April 15th. So you can see mine and others' concerns with regards to the timing. First, how are you going to fund the continued operations after April 15th until uh, the report has made it through the appropriation subcommittees? We are working that um, assiduously at the moment. Uh, uh, we, we, think, we think we can get through this. But you're, you're, you're determined to get through it? That is absolutely the intent. Okay. Uh, uh, second, I, I know that yesterday you said your department was working to expeditiously work to finish the report, but can you give us any more precise timeline on when the department's cost-benefit report and reprogramming request might be sent to Congress? I would prefer to check back with the people and get back, I can get back can to you. Can you get back to uh, me on that? after this, uh, yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Finally, I understand that there's about $10 million of funding that remains available for you to use from the $62 million that Congress appropriated in the um, uh, FY14 omnibus. Are you prepared to utilize those funds to continue operations and avoid a major disruption in the program to cover the gap uh, until the transfer authority is, is received? As I said, I think we have ways of getting through this period. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Right. Well, as you can imagine, I have, I have some concerned constituents that have received warn notices recently and only want to ensure that, that we don't have any work stoppages. Anything that I can do uh, to help move this process along, I want you to know that thank I you. stand ready uh, to help. I thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, not only does this program support jobs for my constituents, but as we've discussed, uh, it's vitally important for our national security and I look forward to working with you on it. I, I would just add that, that uh, again, we are committed to preserving the technology and the IP. Uh, the management structure, uh, for obvious reasons, may be, may be transitioning. Sure. Yeah. Now, uh, shifting gears just a little bit, going back to the LNG export uh, issue, uh, uh, you and I have discussed LNG exports. I co-chair the LNG export working group here in the House. Um, uh, uh, some reports, some press reports, uh, have indicated that um, uh, uh, there's been potentially some kind of deal struck between your department and uh, Senator Stabenow. Uh, you know, she was opposed to liquid natural gas exports. Uh, she was putting a hold on one of your committee's nominees coming through the Senate. Um, and, but now she has said, hey, I'm now more comfortable with what uh, the, uh, the department is doing. Has there been some kind of deal struck between you and Senator Stabenow no, that, we, uh, that we need to know about? Because mm -hmm. quite honestly, Mr. Secretary, and I love the work that you're doing, you and I have a very different uh, definition of uh, expeditiously, <laughs> uh, uh, especially with all of the opportunities for job creation mm -hmm. and energy independence. Uh, I, I just, I, I still fail to understand why it's taken so long to get these permits approved. Uh, first, let me say, Senator Stabenow, of course, is by no means the only member of Congress uh, uh, who is concerned about uh, uh, the, r the ramp rate of, of LNG exports. No, no one, in, no one to my knowledge, is, well, almost no one at least is arguing against LNG exports. It's this whole question of pace and cumulative impacts as it might have in terms of domestic prices for consumers and-, and, and So has there and, been any kind of deal made between- No, so, uh, so we've had uh, uh, with her and with others, we've had discussions about what our process is uh, and what the role is for cumulative impacts uh, on, uh, uh, on, on the economy. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, sir. And uh, I'm going to have uh, some concluding remarks that I want to make. Maybe it will be a question or two in there, and then if, if you want to respond to it, you're free to do so, and certainly Mr. Rush has as well. But. Uh, I just wanted to comment on your response to Cory Gardner's question about his legislation, H.R. 6, uh, conjured up in my mind what I'm getting ready to say. Uh, you, 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 you answered him by saying, you know, that's a legislative decision about whether or not Congress will pass this legislation or not. And part of the animosity that's developed in Congress with the President of the United States particularly has related to climate change. 
and particularly when he has emphatically made it very clear that if Congress does not act in a way that I want it to act, then I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. And the point that I would make is that Congress did act, in my view. Congress did not pass the cap-and-trade bill. It was a Democrat-controlled Senate that did not pass the cap-and-trade bill. The House last week passed legislation that was the first time ever that Congress gave EPA the authority uh, to regulate greenhouse gases, CO2 emissions. Now, I'm not going to get into the court, Supreme Court decision, but this legislation passed Congress given EPA the authority. And uh, uh, we could not get the administration to focus on it. The President said he would veto that bill. So I take from that that if we don't do precisely what he wants on global and uh, on climate change, that, as he said, he will go it alone. And many people in his administration have said the same thing. And so when I look at the — and he's doing that by executive order, by executive actions. And when I look at the budget here, uh, electric delivery and energy reliability, $180 million, renewable energy alone, $1.3 billion. And then when you look at the original legislation establishing the Department of Energy, it says the mission is to promote the interest of consumers through the provision of an adequate and reliable supply of energy at the lowest reasonable cost. And so many agencies of the federal government are totally focused on climate change. That's why so much money is going into that, even though it's contrary to the original mission statute. And the bottom line of it turns out to be this. When EPA issued that greenhouse gas regulation, which in effect makes it impossible to build a new coal plant in America. And I agree with you, Sec Mr. Secretary, no one's getting ready to build a coal plant in America because natural gas prices are so low. But what if we find ourselves the way Europe has found themselves? The, the gas coming from Russia is so expensive that last year Europe imported 53 percent of our coal exports and they're building coal plants. So if our natural gas prices start going up, we don't have the option. And then next year, 2015, they're going to be coming out with a regulation on existing uh, coal-fired plants in addition to the Utility Act, in addition to the new. So we have genuine concerns about our ability to compete in the global marketplace, and we're moving so fast. The President's pushing so hard. I, I agree with uh, Professor uh, uh, Turlington over at George, uh, George Washington University who said the President is becoming a government unto himself. So I just want to make that comment, and you, you may not agree with me on this. Uh, I, cer I certainly don't but, agree with but, uh, I, but let me just conclude by saying thank you for being with us. We look forward to continuing to work with you on a lot of issues affecting our country, and we appreciate your being available all the time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say I, I don't agree with you on this, and I very I rarely agree with you, so it's not uh, out of the question that I don't agree with you right at, at this present time. I think your characterization of uh, the president is uh, it's totally in inadequate, and so, but <clears throat> we've had this agreement for a long time now, and I don't think the <clears throat> either one of us is going to change our opinion about our president. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, one area that DOE can have a direct <clears throat> impact in helping to, to increase minority engagement <clears throat> uh, is in the 17 publicly funded national research labs. Uh, and in areas of contracting, management, and operations, technology transfers, uh, I'm finding that most of these labs are woefully uh, failing in their outreach and partnerships with historical, historically uh, black colleges and universities, uh, minority-serving institutions, as well as 
uh, minority contractors and entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurs and and in the whole uh, area of minority uh, engagement, they are woefully lacking. And uh, I mean, almost uh, uh, heartbreakingly lacking. You look at them, and you look at the lineup, and you, you visit these places, and you see no diversity at all. Uh, and haven't uh, haven't seen diversity uh, there in in decades, and some of them never had a any uh, diverse uh, top level uh, 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 staffing and, and leadership. And <clears throat> I think that, uh, as you indicated earlier, maybe the uh, problem is the lack of minorities in key leadership positions, both at the, at the labs and maybe even at the department itself. And um, uh, what do you think are, uh, are some of the obstacles? That we are, are that we must overcome uh, some of the prohibitions, uh, and is your department sufficiently diverse to in the decision making process to allow for more diversity in uh, in leadership, uh, not only in the department but in at, at, at these labs. I mean, these labs are. We see uh, uh, just uh, enormous public taxpayer dollars, and some of them have don't even remotely reflect uh, any attempt at diversity, and I'm really concerned about that. So, can you uh, give me some idea about how you, uh, what you, uh, how you view the problem and? I know we've had this discussion many times, you know, but uh, I want to just refresh you, uh, the discussion. The, um, first of all, I think it's important that it is clearly understood that the Secretary considers this a priority. And we are promulgating this. Uh, we have raised it with the lab directors. And they have responded enthusiastically. Now, we have to do something about it. But they, frankly, when I raised this at the Laboratory Policy uh, Council, uh, the reaction of the lab directors was, God, you're right. We just got to, we have to do this. So that's, that's a good start, but that's only a start. Number two, uh, we have just in the last month, by the way, including at Argonne, in your neck of the woods, uh, appointed uh, lab directors. Uh, uh, in each case, uh, we went through very carefully the nature of the search, its openness, et cetera. And frankly, while the candidates, the, 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 those appointed themselves, uh, did not increase uh, the diversity, each one of the three made very, very strong commitments to, to look at this. I think that what has been missing, uh, and I'm talking in the, in the, in the laboratory system, and the, the lab directors have responded very positively on this, is we need to, uh, it's not that it's totally missing, but it's, we are not up to snuff in terms of what I would call leadership development programs. Uh, that it's not only for diverse candidates, but, in, but includes a focus on diversity, of uh, understanding, you know, I think as many corporations do, extremely well. They're all, you're always looking to how you develop the leaders in the organization so that you have people who can, who can come up. So that is a focus that, that uh, we, are going to, we are going to advance, um, uh, and we, we have started, but we have a long way to go. Mr. Secretary, I, I really look forward to working with you. And, and see, as you well know, I'm very passionate about this issue. Mm -hmm. I, uh, and so I look forward to working with you on this issue. Right. And Mr. Chairman, I look forward to us having a discussion in terms of having uh, about an, a hearing on yeah. these, this and other matters. Yeah, and we're going to be sitting down the next couple of days on, on your legislation because our staff has been working together. But well, that concludes today's hearing. Mr. Secretary, thank you once again, and thank you for your staff and all of your time and availability.
the record will remain open for 10 days, and uh, with that, the hearing is adjourned.